and dictatorship. Well, sure, I'm asking to explain but, the but differences Gates, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That's really the, the question, Mr. Gates. Why can't you unless, just answer whether or not your amendment unless, would apply Mr. to them? Mr. Gates, this is just a rhetorical exercise. It's, if a, you're it's interested, a serious effort to if understand if whether or not your amendment if applies to your question is sincere, which I know assumes too much, but if it is, it is. then will you support the amendment confined to communist dictatorships? Yes or no, Mr. Gates? I'm probably not going to support the amendment either way. That doesn't well, there matter. you go. I don't, there I don't you want to go. know what well, it then, means. Then what about all the rhetoric you, you constantly espouse about standing up to communism? Here you're saying someone fleeing communism, if they're interdicted between ports, uh, then, then they will not qualify. Right. It doesn't matter what kind of There is regime. a mechanism by which one seeks asylum for those very reasons, and it's not showing up and creating an entire So this whole thing about system. Saudi Arabia is just a red herring, right? I'm Mr. just it's, curious to know whether or not you consider well, I, them qualifying under the bill. Your and I have, but I have I would, I would earned two and a half minutes. Consistency. And it's just a you know, Mr. Schiff, people on the border don't get to have a debate like this. Like you know, it's not your time, Mr. Schiff. I'm if you would stand time. up to Mr. Gates has the time. time. Mr. The Gates has the time. You do. Mr. Gates has the time. Look, on the border, someone get, doesn't get to have this joyful little colloquy with you. A border patrol agent has to look at someone and assess whether or not they're going to let them in or not. And I'm just for clarity, even though I'm not going to support your amendment, I'm going to support the bill. In the unlikely event that your amendment were to be adopted, I simply want to know if someone encounters someone from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whether or not Thank the you. exception that your amendment affords would allow that or not. Well, as I said, I'm using the existing definition, Mr. Gates. My so question, does to, that you definition is, include the my question to you is, will you, will you live up? Shift is an asshole. Uh, guys, smash the thumbs up so people know that this is now going on. Share this out if you could because some people might be looking for the first stream, which was about to be timed out. Uh, if you could like it, share it, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we were, let's check, see if we hit that number. Boom. We have hit 625,000 subscribers. Thank you very much for your support. Let's see how many people keep coming back here. See how many people we're over 3,000 already. This is awesome. You guys rock. You guys rock. All right, let's turn these bobos back on. Of opposition to such party. That is how the code currently defines would a you, totalitarian would you, party. Would you define Saudi and Arabia a totalitarian that way or not? Totalitarian dictatorship. Would you define so them that way you, or not, Adam? So if you wanted to know, read the code. But the but question is not, them or not? The it's question your is not whether you can read the code. The question you, you is the whether you stand you for anything, Mr. To a the question country. is, do, you stand? You, so do you stand for anything? Does anything you say mean I, anything I to you? I merely am seeking but your own you ability really to define so your own soft. amendment. Are you really so soft on communism now, Mr. Gates? I am shocked. Soft on communism? No, You're soft, soft on definitions you would within your own you would, bill. You would prosecute. Soft on the basics of you the would English prosecute language. Soft on the interpretation statute. Someone by which a border patrol agent really will because this. they won't. You know, a border patrol agent is going to gonna have this. Mercifully, the eyes. gentleman is out of time. Mercifully, the gentleman is out of time. Okay. Woo. Should we have unanimous consent to no, continue? No, no. Everybody's out of time. Everybody's out of time. Does anyone does anyone seek recognition? I, I recognize myself uh, to oppose the amendment. I, I just want to say, as much as I was enjoying that uh, colloquy, thank you, Ray. Colloquy, that means um, a lot. I, I do want to say very seriously to Mr. Schiff, I, I, we all understand what you're trying to do here, and and um, by the definition you just read, this is a rough estimate, but I think you just exempted about a billion people worldwide, about a billion people uh, right. from from our, our rules here. And we oppose this amendment because obviously it would do nothing to fix the Thank catastrophe you, of the wrong. southwest border. It would make it worse. Even the Biden administration has enacted port of entry policies because they recognize um, that we've got to get a hold of this. And so if, if you're going to if you're going to lump in all communist and totalitarian, uh, totalitarian uh, states and dictatorships around the globe, obviously the catastrophe becomes exponentially worse. We oppose communism, Thank we you. oppose totalitarianism, and the way we do that, once again, to repeat what has been said so many times here today, is that we have a strong border, strong sovereignty, and a strong America, because it is the perception of a strong America that keeps all those totalitarians and dictators and tyrants at bay. Um, I will Mr. Chairman, yield, yield to Mr. Roy. Uh, I appreciate the, the chairman yielding. I'll, I'll just make a couple of points. Um, right now at the border, 
cartels pay particularly or require a particularly large payment from China in particular and communist countries generally. Uh, these people are paying cartels tens of thousands of dollars, some, at some points, forty to $60,000 a head. So if we were to go down the road that my colleagues are suggesting, what we were going to do is create an even bigger market for targeting those particular individuals uh, and trying to uh, rake in profit for cartels to move more people from China. And also remind you that in FY22, China had 68,000 legal immigrants. Cuba had 31,300 legal immigrants. Vietnam had 23,800 legal immigrants. We have paths for people to pursue the legal process. We have paths for people to pursue asylum. Uh, what we are doing here, I think, would just make the situation fundamentally worse uh, with respect to empowering cartels to make extraordinary profits, uh, trying to move a particular set of individuals uh, rather than another set of individuals. We've had an enormous strain at the border already. Uh, according to um, CBP, we had 4,366 migrants from China encountered by Border Patrol officials on the southern border from October 22 to February 23. That compares with the 421 who were encountered during the same period between 21 and 22. We know what the problem is, the failed policies of this administration. We're working to try to fix those policies and our colleagues on the other side of the aisle do not wish to join in. I yield, I yield back to the chair. Uh, yield to Mr. McClintock. Mr. Chair, we, we get right back in all these discussions to the same central issue. Asylum is for those who are persecuted by their government, as the general lady from Washington so expertly and clearly noted just a few hours ago. Living in a failed state is not grounds for asylum. Fear of violence is not grounds for asylum. Living in poverty is not grounds for asylum, and living under communist regimes is not grounds for asylum. The gentleman from Louisiana is absolutely correct, actually lowballed. There are currently an estimated one and a half billion people living under communist regimes. Mr. Schiff seems to believe that every one of them has the right to immigrate to the United States. That is absurd. The system is glutted with fraudulent claims Hired. that have nothing to do with governmental persecution. And, 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 and those who are making those claims do so for a simple reason. It gets them under this administration and in contravention of law, instant admission to the country, uh, indefinite uh, uh, work authorization, indefinite residency, and an awful lot of free stuff. That's what's driving this, and that is what is crowding out the legitimate claims from people who are actually being persecuted by their governments and have a rightful claim to asylum. I yield back. Very well said. I uh, yield the balance of my time back. Uh, Mr. Cicilline seeks recognition. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. I yield first to Mr. Schiff. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I just uh, want to see uh, if I can wrap my head around the opposition to this amendment. I guess the opposition began by saying this is too broad. This is too broad. The definition of the code is too broad uh, because it might apply to Saudi Arabia. Well, God forbid we should be concerned with dissidents fleeing the Saudi regime, dissidents being hunted down around the world. I, I guess my colleagues on the other side of the aisle would find it preferable if the dissidents. Uh, shoot me an email at uh, guns and gadgets, A N D, guns and gadgets at charter.net. That would be cool. Real cool. Sorry, I'm exhausted. <laughs> are captured and some are Why was that so hard to say? May I uh, please finish? I haven't yielded, Mr. Chairman. Um, has a time. There are Saudis who are deserving of protection from the regime. They are fleeing. There are, in fact, Saudis who are American residents, who were journalists, who were cut to pieces with the, with the participation of the crown prince. But if your objection is, no, we have to protect the kingdom at all costs because, of course, the kingdom has been so good to us. Um, they constricted oil, oil sales because they're so good to us. Uh, we really need to look after the Saudis, and God forbid we should, we should be concerned about people fleeing uh, Saudi Arabia. But, but if that was the concern, this was too broad. Offer to narrow it so that the amendment would precisely match the rhetoric on the other side, this, this, this grave concern you so often express for those fleeing Venezuela. I just want to punch his eyeballs. <laughs> 
Uh, but no, no, that's no good either. Is that maybe too narrow? Are there too many communist regimes, some that you're okay with and some you're not okay with? I don't understand the opposition, um, except for the fact that, uh, well, I guess all the talk about being tough on communist regimes um, doesn't seem to matter uh, when we're talking about the political value of the border security argument. Um, and with that, I will yield back to my colleague, Mr. Cicilline. I thank the gentleman. And you know, I rise in strong support of this amendment. One of the things that I think we have been most proud of as a country is that America has been a place where people who are fleeing repressive governments, dictatorships, communism, can come to America and have a reasonable opportunity uh, to enter the United States. This amendment preserves that. And, you know, I, I think we're living in a time where we're seeing a democratic recession around the world uh, and where democracies are being tested. And America has to remain a place where people can come if they're fleeing these kinds of repressive governments. Minor and I know it's maybe it's just coincidence, but I know now as we're about to enter another presidential campaign, the Republican frontrunner and recently indicted former president likes to discuss the great relationships he has with the war criminal Vladimir Putin and President Xi. And we just learned a conservative Supreme Court justice was recently exposed for spending 25 years palling around with a billionaire with a prized collection of Nazi memorabilia, Hitler's art, and even a signed copy of Mon Kampf. And so, I don't know, begins to raise a question about the willingness of our colleagues to stand up strongly against these kinds of totalitarian and communist leaders around the world and remain a safe haven for people fleeing those kinds of governments. So if we pass this bill in its current form, you will ban people who are fleeing those from coming in other than imports of entry. Mr. Schiff's amendment provides some relief, but for goodness sakes, can't we agree that when we say those things, that America's a place you can come when you're fleeing communism and totalitarianism, that we mean it? That it's not just a speech to give to your constituents back home to make you look like you're a patriot and you support American democracy and you stand up against tyranny? Vote that way. Let's prove to them in a bipartisan way we mean it when we say that. And I thank Mr. Schiff for giving us that opportunity. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Big, seek recognition. Yes, uh, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you so much. I'll yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Mr. Chairman, the great irony is that I agree with Mr. Schiff as to Saudi Arabia. I just wanted to hear him say it. I am frustrated deeply by the actions of the kingdom as a totalitarian regime. I think that particularly I am aggrieved at what they did in Pensacola, where a Saudi officer opened fire on my constituents, killing three of them and injuring others. And so don't just assume that because I'm asking a question about the vagueness of a term that I disagree with the underlying point that might be expressed Outstanding. on the other side of the, of the aisle. It was we, what the committee just witnessed was recalcitrance as a replacement for reason in our discourse. And the critique of the language as vague is clear because while you're able to cite documents that cite other criteria, what we have observed having gone to the border is that oftentimes these are real-time flashpoint decisions that have to be made at scale because you get hundreds of people showing up and a border patrol agent or two having to process them. So I wasn't attempting to disagree with Mr. Will, the, will the gentleman yield? I, uh, well, yeah, unfortunately, Mr. Biggs has time. You know what? We, uh, Mr. Chairman, I could have had the opportunity to have a more extended discussion with Mr. Schiff had he been will willing to yield some of his time. But instead, I guess uh, we had to go through all of this. But I'll, I'll yield back to Mr. Biggs. Thanks. I yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Vendrew. Thank you, Mr. Biggs. You know what? Um, I, a couple thoughts. I know there's a lot of attorneys in here and we're doing we have a lot of fancy language and that's all good. I'm a I'm a country dentist. All right. And let me tell you what people are thinking. They are thinking that we have a lot of problems in America, that we don't have, we certainly want immigration, legal immigration. How many damn times do we have to say that? Legal immigration done in an organized way to make sure that we take care at the same time of the people who live here. We can't take on every person from every country 
who has a problem in the entire world, especially all at once. I find the conversation demeaning to us in a way because there's no you know, underlying desire to do anything about elections or that this is some kind of MAGA effort or whatever it's been called over a period of time. What it is is if you talk to a lot of people, if you all go back to your district and you listen to them, they will tell you that they're tired. They're tired of paying so many taxes. They're tired of so much crime. They're tired of so many problems. They're tired of having open borders. We're tired that of hearing doesn't you mean talk. we don't have immigration. Of course we do. It's a good thing. We were all immigrants, but we are tired in America of the fact that we just can't take care of the entire world all at once. We pay for everything. We do as much as we can. Um, we take in a lot of people. We have record amounts of immigration legal in our country, but we can't do it all at once, whether communist or not communist, whether a dictatorship or not. Um, we can't say if we took on every person from every country in the world Appreciate that wasn't you. treated right, there'd be no America left. Now, let's tell the truth. Let's be intellectually honest and say what this is. So why don't we stop and just vote on the bill and, you know, realize that people have different opinions. But I do have to say, and I'll wrap up with this, that it is disturbing when you accuse people of something just because you disagree with them. There's no underlying secret mission here of politics. This is simply that the system we have is broken. Next, it has to be fixed. It'll take multiple stages and multiple times. And we have to take care of our American people. I yield back. Please stop, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me we recently actually had a vote on on the issue of socialism, and there was only one party that was divided on whether they could they should condemn socialism, uh, or and or, or view it with approbation, and uh, and we know which party that was, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? If not the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. No. Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Please, please no more. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Thank Roy. You. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein Thank votes no. Mr. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. No. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. No. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Mr. Ivy votes aye. All members voted. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a country dentist. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 22 noes. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Does anyone seek recognition? 
gentleman from Maryland. The clerk will report the amendment. Reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Mr. McClintock. Come on, man. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered without, by Without Mr. objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is our third attempt at trying to address the uh, strict liability language in this uh, criminalization yeah. provision. Um, as we've discussed previously, um, Title V in its current form would make overstaying a visa a crime for the first time in our history. Uh, it's important to remember that if a person overstays their visa, they're already subject to removal. Uh, so the addition of a criminal penalty is uh, cruel and unnecessary, certainly more than is needed here. Uh, and as we've discussed previously, I think there, there's certainly legal infirmity with respect to um, a criminal provision that has no mens rea requirement or intent requirement. Uh, and we've also discussed a few moments ago issues of physical incapability. The language here ex ex expressly uh, references emergency medical situations uh, or other situations which may be deemed humanitarian in nature. Um, I recognize the opposition on the other side with respect to some of the, the other versions of this that we propose. So here we, we suggest exceptional or exigent circumstances as compromise language to try and address their concerns, but also uh, limit criminal liability to uh, issues where a crime has actually been, been committed. And by that, I mean some kind of intentional act that is- uh, right, Thank you very uh, much, uh, Ruth. Has, has criminal impact. Um, so your honor, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I yes. apologize. Yes. <laughs> Flashback, I apologize. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so with that, I, I, re I request the uh, support and, uh, of the amendment. Counselor yields back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, does the gentleman insist on his point of order? Mr. Point of order is, is withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Brand is recognized. Um, uh, I presume Mr. Ivey, when he was saying your honor, was speaking to me, so I'll, I'll respond. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Ivey. Just, just to make a couple quick points about this. I know we've uh, talked about this uh, over the past couple of amendments, but uh, just to take the last portion of this language, which may be deemed humanitarian in nature, I just want to say, uh, the language is overly broad and ambiguous, even if the intent of this particular uh, amendment was uh, well-founded, that particular language would make it uh, very hard to enforce and in fact give uh, Secretary Mayorkas the ability to say everybody falls under that in a lot of uh, situations. Again, the language in this particular provision in Section 501 and 502 provides for 10 days uh, beyond the, the stay uh, period that, that's allowed before this statute actually kicks in. It's a reasonable period of time. Uh, there's still prosecutorial discretion out there, as we mentioned earlier. And back to the mens rea uh, issue earlier, uh, th again, there's other examples of crimes such as bigamy and possession that in the law do not require mens rea. That uh, simply is not necessary here as well. With that, I yield. Was Germany yield? Do you yield, yield to Mr. McClintock? I certainly will, Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you. I just want to add one thing. If, if, if you read the amendment, the section should not apply to any alien who demonstrates exceptional or exigent circumstances, including emergency medical situations and other situations which may be deemed humanitarian in nature. That is precisely why we have case by case parole, which we are trying to reestablish under the law. It, it, um, this, you, you simply stated why we have an individual parole for, for people whose uh, emergencies do not allow the time to go through the normal process. Of, uh, and and uh, at the same time, the, you, your, your administration has destroyed that whole concept of case-by-case -case parole in, in favor of making broad categorical changes. So this is, this is redundant, the whole purpose of the bill. I, I yield back to the gentleman. Will, will the gentleman yield? I, I will yield. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with respect to the um, language uh, situations may be deemed humanitarian in nature, I would note that it's conjunctive and not disjunctive. In other words, it's connected by the term and. So the, the language that precedes it would have to be uh, in place as well. It's not separate. 
and wouldn't stand alone on its own. So that humanitarian up, yeah. in nature uh, wouldn't be the sole basis for an exception here under this language. So I, I think that's addressed. Uh, with respect to the um, <laughs> the bigamy example, I, I guess that scenario where somebody got married but didn't realize they got, that was no intent. <laughs> They, they didn't intentionally get married or they didn't know they got married. I, I don't know that it's a good example or a, a, a good analogy here. I think with respect to this issue, uh, you know, 10 days is um, a relatively short period of time for a criminal's provision to kick in. And we're not asking for people to um, have automatic exceptions. I, I think exceptional or ex exigent circumstances are a relatively high standard with respect to uh, an excused uh, mistake or, or, you know, violation of this provision. So we're, we're trying to respect the fact. So over 5,200 people in here, if you all could do me a solid and just hit that thumbs up, that'll greatly help this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Please help this, uh, get out. That bothers some people, but uh, there are certainly scenarios in the pan pandemic was definitely one of those where, 10 days passed, we had courts that were closed for 18 months to, and beyond. So uh, I, with that, I would yield back. And thank would you. the gentleman yield? The gentleman. Yes, to Mr. Ice, I sure will, go ahead. Thank you, uh, thank you for yielding. I don't wanna consume much time, but there is one thing that hopefully our folks on the other side of the aisle will appreciate. And that is that nothing in this legislation requires the US attorney to prosecute any of these overstays. And I think that prosecutorial uh, decision-making by U.S. attorneys is pretty common. So the reality is for most overstays, they would simply be removed. And if they obviously met a high standard or for some other reason were justified, then and only then would a, a U.S. attorney spend his or her time actually prosecuting the individual. So I think this exception is unnecessary because it would be un unlikely to ever prosecute somebody who had met any of the criteria that they're saying. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. The gentleman Chairman. from Maryland, seek recognition. Just briefly. Um, with respect, well, I think I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You gotta get somebody to yield to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Jayapal is recognized. Uh, thank you. I, I yield to the gentleman. Thank you. Uh, we, we discussed prosecutorial discretion a few minutes ago, and I think uh, we made it clear then, and it's, um, I don't think there's any doubt about it, that it, prosecutorial you, discretion is not very, a substitute very humbling. for you, mens rea requirements, intent requirements, or basic elements of a criminal law violation. Because if that were the case, um, you wouldn't need intent or knowledge in any criminal provision. You could always say that the prosecutors just don't have to bring the case. Uh, but obviously that's not how federal or any state criminal law or common law as to the best of my knowledge is structured. So <laughs> I, I don't think that's Thanks, applicable man. here. Uh, and I did want to make one last point all we with, can with do, respect right? to this too. Um, the chairman of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, the com on the Committee on Migration sent language to us, uh, a letter in which they expressed concerns about this overall bill, uh, and mentioned specific provisions, I'll read it. Among the problematic provisions in this combined bill that the USCCB Committee on Migration believes warrant its opposition to the measure are those that would, I'll skip some of the others, but the one particular, particularly relevant here, criminalize visa overstays, even those that are inadvertent or based on a pending adjustment of status. Uh, so. Uh, I would ask that this be made part of the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Uh, and with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does anyone else? See? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Jayapal. It's... Oh, no, not her again. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady yields back. Anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? Aye. No. The opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Hit those likes, please. Hit those likes. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Isa. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. No. 
Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. No. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Ms. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, you are not recorded. Aye. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Ms. Sparts, you are not recorded. Ms. Sparts votes no. Any other members wish to vote? If not, the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and 22 noes. The noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. The gentleman from Rhode Island, seek recognition. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Reserve a point of order. The point of order is reserved, Mr. McClintock, and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. McClintock. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment amends Section 602 of Title VI to allow adjustment of status applicants to continue to access work authorization. This bill drastically limits the use of the parole power and further limits uh, which parolees may actually obtain work authorization. Traditionally, a large variety of parolees are, are eligible for work authorization, but this bill uh, may, it will, in fact, shrink that dramatically. The bill limits work authorization specifically to two classes of potential parole recipients, the spouses and minor children of active duty service members and certain Cuban family members of U.S. permanent residents. This bill specifically states anyone else who is granted parole may not accept employment. With this limitation, the bill bars a wide group of often highly skilled immigrants from being able to accept employment, applicants for adjustment of status. Because our legal immigration system has not been meaningfully updated in 30 years, some professionals with badly needed skills are unable to obtain non-immigrant or temporary visas because of arbitrary time or numerical limitations. However, some of the, these professionals can file green card applications, allowing them to obtain parole and work authorization to work in the United States. A great example of this is the Physician National Interest Waiver Program. Through this brutal awakening to a or support GOA with no compromise, the no compromise roast. Start working and the green cards are only issued after Homeland Security verifies that the doctors completed their five-year commitment. National interest waiver doctors without non-immigrant status must apply for parole and work authorization to complete their five-year commitment. Because this bill as it's currently written does not allow parolees who are green card applicants to work, it would prevent some doctors from being able to access this program and provide desperately needed health care to the most underserved areas in the United States. And that's just one example. I'm sure this was an oversight in the drafting, but
But to correct this, my amendment would add green card applicants to the list of parolees who can accept employment. I can't see any reason why all of my colleagues would not support this simple, common sense fix. I urge you to help highly skilled professionals uh, have the ability to continue to work in the United States, uh, particularly after the example I gave, which is so urgent. Uh, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? No. Please. Point of order is withdrawn. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Wisconsin, seek recognition? Uh, yes. <laughs> Gentleman's recognized. the gentleman entertain a question of course um so who are you uh, could you just restate who you're seeking to help here adjustment of statter applicants and the example i use is the physician national interest waiver program this is a program again for doctors who can apply for green cards if they agree to work full-time in a medically underserved area for five years while they can file their application before they start working and the green card is only issued after Homeland Security verifies that the doctors completed their five-year commitment. That's just one example. But right now, this bill as is written limits uh, or prevents anyone other than certain Cuban family members of U.S. permanent residents and children of active duty service members from accessing work authorizations. And this will uh, allow that for people who are applicants for adjustment of status. <sighs> What the hell was that? Um, so uh, um, I would just say in regards to this, we don't believe that this is necessary under this bill, but I'd be happy to talk to you offline here to see um, if we're missing something, but I believe that it is not necessary uh, to do this under the bill that we, under the underlying bill. <laughs> Um, if, if the gentleman yield up, um, I, yeah. I'm not sure why you think it's not necessary since the bill as it's currently written restricts people who are eligible for work authorizations to two categories. People who have a certain Cuban family members who are permanent U.S. residents or children of active duty service members. It precludes people who are applicants for adjustment of status from getting a work authorization. It restricts parolees in those areas. So I think the, the language of the bill as drafted does in fact restrict parolees to those two categories. And all this amendment would do is, and I think this was an oversight, all this would do is just allow um, applicants for adjustment of status for that example I used with the doctors to be eligible for work authorization. So uh, we're happy to talk to you about this off, offline and consider this, um, but at this time, I'm going to urge a no vote on this, but we will work on it offline. And I yield back to uh, the chair. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Rhode Island. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Roll the amendment call. is not agreed to. Roll call. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Dan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Isa. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. No. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. <laughs> That's a good Mr. one. McClintock votes no. Mr. <laughs> Tiffany. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes no. Mr. Klein. <laughs> Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. No. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Ms. Moran. Ms. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes no. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Aye. 
Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. <laughs> Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Negus. Mr. Negus votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, you are not recorded. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Any other members wish to vote? The clerk will report. Ms. Bartz, you are not recorded. Ms. Bartz votes no. Mr. Chair, there are 14 ayes and 21 noes. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Who seeks recognition? The gentleman from Rhode Island. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Oh, fuck. Point, of order. point of order is reserved by Mr. McClintock. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. McClintock, offered by Mr. Cicilline. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Title I of this bill contains one of the most egregious and serious attacks on our asylum system that Congress has ever seen. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, the asylum system in the United States was once described as the crown jewel of America's humanitarian efforts around the world by the evangelical community in this country. So this is a deeply respected system of humanitarian work. Uh, the provisions in this bill take um, numerous parts of the Trump administration regulation that is colloquially referred to as the death to asylum regulation. That regulation you may recall was struck down in court, but my colleagues on the Republican side have seen fit to resurrect it in the contents of this bill. My amendment would strike Title I from the bill. While this section is called the Asylum Reform and Border Protection Act, it doesn't reform our asylum system at all. It destroys it. This bill would, among other things, bar nearly everyone who transited through a third country to get to the United States, which would shut down asylum access to almost anyone who can't take a direct flight to, uh, I'm sorry, from their uh, country of, of persecution. It also ends the right to asylum to anyone including unaccompanied children, crosses the border between ports of entry. Title I also massively expands the type of criminal conduct that can bar an individual from obtaining asylum and allows adjudicators to consider a broad range of evidence to determine the individual committed the crime. This includes facts not found by the criminal court or provided in the record of conviction. The bill also allows adjudicators to consider Interpol red notices as reliable evidence the applicant committed a crime. The inclusion of red notices as reliable evidence is particularly concerning as Russia and China abuse them to punish dissidents and Uyghurs. It's really kind of unbelievable that the majority would include in this legislation provisions that want to elevate red notices as reliable evidence given their known and widespread misuse. This bill also makes sweeping changes to the definition of various grounds of asylum, including particular social group and political opinion, which would bar many people who have legitimate protection claims from being able to attempt to obtain asylum. If Title I were to become law, we would no longer have a legitimate asylum system. I urge my colleagues to accept this amendment and really remove these really egregious uh, provisions in this bill and restore America to the position of being proud of an asylum system that welcomes people 
fleeing war, famine, persecution, and other harms. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes myself uh, in opposition to the amendment. Oh, point of order is withdrawn. Thank you. Um, my friend from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Cicilline, has cited a number of times now how it, it apparently used to be an evangelical position. I think that I think it still is. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I just want to make sure that people uh, know that, you know, okay. since, since I am one and I don't think you profess to be, do you? An evangelical? No, I don't. But okay. I, well, I let me tell not... you what we really believe. Hold on. Hold on. It's my time. Due, due in, in large part to our Judeo-Christian foundations and the deep religious heritage we enjoy in this country, America is the most benevolent nation in the history of the world, by far. It's not even close. But we cannot maintain our strength and generosity if we surrender our own safety and sovereignty. And preserving law and order and securing our borders should not be partisan issues. These are matters of common sense. And there are certainly responsibilities fully authorized by the Bible and expected of us by God. And if you want to get into that, I'll be happy to have a colloquy on the subject. But let me just say that uh, providing refuge for individuals feeling persecution has been a central tenet of U.S. immigration law for decades. And the asylum process itself is a testament to our history as a beacon of hope and freedom and opportunity for millions around the world. But right now, the reality is, and the reason we're here, and the reason this provision is in the bill, and it's one I've been working on since I got here seven years ago, is because the reality is stark and it is uh, alarming because we've had drug cartels and activist judges and human struggling, uh, smuggling operations and the open borders lobby and radical liberal administrations that have worked in tandem to undermine the integrity of this immigration system. And in the process, they weaken the protections for those who are truly seeking a safe haven from persecution by forcing them uh, in, into a years long line in immigration court. And we all agree that the current asylum system is in desperate need of repair so this bill provides the necessary tools to fix it. Now, instead of proposing solutions to the real issues facing this, this system, our Democrat friends have resorted to their favorite talking point. You know, they, they call us who are proposing these bills, you know, racist and anti-immigrant and xenophobic and all that. But it's just the arguments are worn out. And, and far left groups have leveled similar accus accusations anytime anyone proposes even the slightest speed bump to open borders. And that's the reality. Um, the ACLU, for example, has repeatedly has described even the Biden administration's toothless border enforcement efforts as illegal and promoting suffering. And it's, it's just an unsustainable situation. Look, everybody can see this for themselves on the news. We see the videos. We see the people piled on top of trains. We see the, 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 the rush to the borders. And it's not a sustainable situation. And even some, some of our friends on the other side have acknowledged this problem tonight. And so this first provision, the first, first 43 pages of the bill, is essential to fixing the problem. And, and suggesting that you want to amend it and strike it out is just absurd. We, we are trying to, no, I want, I'm not going to yield. You, you've talked a lot. We, we, are, we, are, we are here to Wait, solve the problem, and you are not. Is that the standard? If you talk a lot, you don't yield? And, and you are not. <laughs> And wow. I wanted to read you a biblical uh, a, a oh, passage okay. of the Let's Bible. Do that. Yes, I will yield to that. Thank Please you. That. Thank goodness. I just, you made reference to the biblical re, uh, yes. discussion. I want to read to you from Leviticus, 1, uh, Leviticus 19. Okay. Yes, when it. a stranger resides within yes. your land, yes. you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Right, right. And that's always the verse that is cited by our friends on the other side to suggest that we're somehow, you know, being unchristian uh, for, for doing this. But here's the, here's the thing. Here's what you don't understand. Anytime you're going to try to apply a, a Bible verse, you have to understand it in its context. And this, this passage is often cited out of context. You have to see to whom the order is given. That, that order is not given to the civil authorities and the government. That order is given to individuals. To the, to the community, to people. And yes, we're all called. Hey, we are. We are. But you're trying to pass a law to make the civil authorities, the civil government do this, and that is not an order that is given to the civil government. That is a command given to people, individuals, and families. All of us on this side subscribe to that ideology. We do reach out to the sojourner, but it is not the job of the federal government to do it. And anytime somebody cites this out of order, they need to also know and I'm sorry, I'm glad I got 30 seconds and maybe somebody will yield me some more because we could do this all day. But um, if you if you read the, the Bible in its appropriate context, you know that the Bible speaks favorably and consistently about distinct nations of people, 
about borders and walls that are built to guard and secure people, property, and jurisdiction. In Nehemiah in the Old Testament, he heroically led the Jewish remnant to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after enemy, enemies had destroyed them and burned them with fire. And God anointed that noble, noble work because he knew that a nation is not a nation unless it has a sovereign uh, border, unless it has a wall to protect itself. And that's oh, what we're you. doing. We don't build walls because we hate the people on the outside. We build walls because we love the people on the inside. And that is a Christian admonition that we follow. And we do it with all our heart. And so it, it is it's offensive for, to me for people who don't read the Bible to cite it out of context and tell me that I'm not following it. And I'll have this conversation all night long and I'm out of time, unfortunately. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I seek recognition. The gentleman's recognized. You are uh, <laughs> not taking the Bible in proper context. Oh. When Nehemiah led the Jews back to uh, Jerusalem, it was still part of the Persian Empire. So the walls were open to everybody in the Persian Empire. So it was no, open, th not closed. No. Yes. That that, is, will the gentleman yield? I will yield. Okay, that's not right. So, so David was a cupbearer. David was a, a, I mean, not David. Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king. He was uh, in, in Babylon at the time. He had the king's favor and he went back. And he saw that the walls were smoldered, the walls of Jerusalem, the great city of David, that the walls were broken down and burned with fire, and it broke his heart. And so he called upon all the people, all the Israelites, and he said, you're, come, you're, let us rebuild the wall. We will no longer be in shame. You're claiming my time. Yes, unfortunately. That was all possible because the Persian Empire had defeated the Babylonian Empire, which had destroyed Jerusalem in the first place. And the Persian king, uh, Cyrus the Great, um, asked Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem as part of the Persian Empire. Okay. Not as a separate thing, as part of the overall Persian Empire, which included all the people. We started off with the border security. Now we're arguing about the Bible. This is why government sucks. I just, you know, there was reference in my initial remarks about the position of the evangelical community. And while the chairman uh, purported to speak for them, we have received a letter actually from the uh, Evangelical Immigration Table. It's a list of um, Bethany Christian Services, the Council for Christian Colleges, the National Association of Evangelicals, among others. And in the letter, they express deep concern about the provisions of this bill in particular. And I like to read a portion of it. They say, we are we uh, believe that God has made every human being in his image with inherent dignity. This means that human life is worth protecting regardless of one's nationality, ethnicity, religion, gender, or any other factor. This belief is at the foundation of our asylum laws, which offer protection to those who reach the United States and can demonstrate a credible fear of persecution for reasons outlined in U.S. law. This does not mean that everyone who reaches the U.S. border should be allowed in, but it does mean that we ensure due process for those seeking asylum under the terms of U.S. law, we ask you to oppose any legislation that in any way undermines due process for asylum seekers. So they affirm, again, their longstanding belief of the important values that our asylum system presents. And I concur completely with the brilliant religious analysis by the ranking member. And the presumption that as a Jew, I don't read the Bible was deeply offensive. I know you didn't mean it. No, I didn't mean yeah, that. The Old Testament belongs to us in case you okay, forgot. Okay. I yield back. <laughs> did, did the gentleman ask unanimous consent to enter something into the record? I don't know. It's granted if you want to. Okay. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, real quick before. I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry. It's still the, oh, the uh, so ranking member's time. In claiming my time, I simply want to inform the chairman. Reclaiming my time, I simply want to inform the chairman that the proper pronunciation is not Nehemiah, it's Nehemiah in the original <laughs> Hebrew. I yield back. <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, gentleman yields back who seeks recognition. Uh, Mr. Biggs, recognize. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I'm going to yield to you so you guys can continue this <laughs> riveting discussion. But I just wanted to point out uh, that the letter that you just came into us as part of our record from Bethany Christian Services. Bethany Christian Services derives a significant amount of its, its revenue from us and the United Nations. Mm -hmm. This is the way it is, because they make money, they make money on the, the illegal uh, human trade. And with that, I'm going to yield to the gentleman who's in the chair. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for, <laughs> very grateful for the yield. 
Um, listen, I, I don't. Um, it's our Judeo-Christian history, and, and it, we call it the Old Testament, but we, we equally respect the book, and I know you do as well. Um, but I, I just want to point out, and we don't want to, we don't want to belabor this because we've all been here too long, but there, there is a deep yeah, theological too, discussion about this. But it, it is, I, I think it's, it's unfair, and I don't, you don't mean to be unfair, I don't think, but when you, when you guys on this side, when you imply that those of us on this side who are trying to strengthen the border and protect our country are somehow... It's been said several times here today. It's anti-Christian. It's immoral. It's the opposite of that. We love people. And yes, we're all made in God's image. We learned that from the Torah, from the Old Testament and the New, right? And because we're all made in God's image, every single person has an estimable dignity and value. And your value is not related in any way to the color of the skin or what your skin or what nation you come from or what zip code you live in or how good looking you are. Your value is inherent because it's given to you by your creator. We all believe that. So in, in order to protect our sovereignty and to protect our country and make, maintain our position as the most benevolent nation in the world. Thank you. We have to have a secure border. You can't have a country if you don't have a border. That's what this is about. We're trying to be good to all people. We do want to be benevolent. We do want to be the refuge for those who are genuinely suffering Thank persecution. You. But the reality is right now, our system is overrun because it is being abused. It does not work. And that's why it's all clogged up. And that's why we're in a good faith trying to fix it. Mr. Roy, I yield to you. Wait, wait. So oh, just, I, I think I still control the time. I'm sorry. Uh, Are you, yeah. And I'm going to yield to you in a second. I just want to, ah. I just want to emphasize that uh, Bethany Christian Services receives 129 million dollars in service revenue from the U.S. government and the UN, and that effectively is. What? The well, the gentleman, you have to just went one quick question. It's yeah. also signed by the Evangelical Association of America. What about okay. them? And they're they're a left of center group, and they have their perspective as well. Okay, that that Mr. Mr. Cicilline, I haven't done the research. Left of center. I haven't, I haven't done the research on those guys. So, yes, here we go. I, I have. Roy. I have. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I, I thank the uh, gentleman for yielding, and I would, I would only note that um, our friends in Israel. By have a far. fairly well-regarded <laughs> physical barrier along the West Bank that is quite effective uh, and secures the state of Israel quite well. And in fact, those of us on both sides of the aisle who travel to Israel, who have seen that security fence and physical barrier, know know full well how successful it has been in helping Me to too, secure Israel. Thirteen hours, boys and girls. And it, I would note that Israel has also been a state that has welcomed refugees, like our country does, uh, through legal channels and legal processes, notably recently from Ukraine and finding ways to, to help uh, folks from Ukraine. Notably, in my travels there, going to hospitals in the northern part of Israel, uh, to hospitals that were helping those from Syria get care, secreting them in and out so that those children would actually get care and not let them know that they got care in Israel because it would have been. Still over 5,100 people here. Thank you so much. We're waiting for what we want, obviously. Smash the thumbs up. Share it if you can. Get this through that anti-gun algorithm here on YouTube. I appreciate y'all. I really do. 13 hours almost. Who would have thought? Louisiana. I would just note that even heaven has walls, as described in the book of Revelation, and a gate at which you must present yourself. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you. And if if everybody promises we're going to move along, then I'm I'm willing to yield the rest of my time. Just uh, yield yeah, okay, me Mr. so I won't have Mr. Cicilline, I'll I'll yield some time to you. Thank you. I just want to make just so it's clear. Uh, in addition to defending Bethany Christian Services, which I think does really important work, the letter is also signed by the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. I don't think you want to criticize them. And maybe most importantly, the Southern Baptist Convention. Yeah, I'm I mean, one of those, these and I are work for a Christian evangelical college. groups and the National Association of Evangelicals. So, in fairness, this is a group okay, of Okay, I'm going to reclaim, I'm gonna reclaim and give four seconds to the chair if you want to sit. And then yeah, I'm I, done. I am a Southern Baptist, used to be a trustee, and I work for a Christian college. So, there, everybody can disagree, agree to disagree. Gentlemen's out of time. Who else seeks recognition? All right. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Rhode Island. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson, Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson, Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. 
Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Thank you. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparks. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Vandrew. No. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. No. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. No. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes no. Mr. Fry. No. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Right. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Jo Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swallow. Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagus. Mr. Nagus votes aye. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Any other members wish to vote? Please no. Clerk will report. Nope. Ms. Ms. Sparks, you're not recorded. Ms. Sparks votes no. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and 23 noes. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Who seeks recognition? Ms. Jaipal. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Ugly reserve, foot. Point of order. Come on. Point of order reserved by Mr. McClintock. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without uh, objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentlewoman is recognized to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is simple. It would delay the effective date of Title III until all families separated by the Trump administration's cruel family separation policy are reunited. In 2018, Mr. Chairman, the the, 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 uh, the, the committee be in order. Thank you. In 2018, my colleagues and I watched in horror as news leaked of the Trump administration's cruel and deliberate family separation policy. I was the first member of Congress to go into a federal prison and talk to hundreds of parents who had been cruelly separated from their children, some as young as just a few months old. I will never forget their stories of agony as they heard their children crying for them in another room but were unable to go to them, many not knowing for weeks or even months where their children were, going to the bathroom and finding their children taken forcibly separated from them when they returned. Immigration agents told them, your families don't exist anymore, and told the children that their parents had abandoned them. The vast majority had horrific stories of violence and persecution and were seeking asylum, doing what any parent would do to protect their children from violence and even death. And yet, with Republicans in the majority at that time, not a single hearing not a single hearing was held to hold the Trump administration accountable. In fact, I remember very clearly raising the issue right here in this committee room. I was sitting about where Ms. Escobar is during a hearing on something completely different and demanding that Trump and his cruel policy be brought to an end. But even as outrage across the country kept rising, even as former First Lady, Republican First Lady Laura Bush, even Senator Lindsey Graham, big majorities of Republicans and Democrats and independents across the country expressed outrage and shame at this policy, Republicans in Congress did nothing, nothing, not a single hearing. And finally, the outrage grew so enormous that former President Trump was shamed into ending the policy six weeks after it began. However, even during that short time, nearly 4,000 families were separated, 
causing untold damage to these parents and children for years to come. When Democrats took the majority in 2019, we immediately launched investigations and we held multiple oversight hearings. This committee even published a 400 page report detailing our oversight efforts and providing a complete narrative of the inhumane family separation policy in the administration's own words. The investigation revealed that the Trump administration's family separation policy lasted far longer than is commonly known and was marked by reckless incompetence and intentional cruelty. Cruelty. Worse still, the previous administration's officials knew that the government lacked the capacity to track separated family members and they moved forward with separations anyway. This cruel zero humanity policy impacted both citizens and immigrants alike. Just last week, the New York Times revealed that as many as a thousand US citizen children were separated from their parents as part of this policy. Due to the prior administration's willful incompetence, efforts to reunify separated immigrant and US citizen children continue to this day. On February 2nd, 2021, Thank President you. Biden established the Interagency Task Force on the Reunification of Families to continue this critical work. And under the leadership of Secretary Mayorkas, the task force has worked tirelessly to identify the remaining separated children, to facilitate their reunification with their families, provide needed support services to, to reunified families, and to prevent future family separations. The task force has now reunited more than 600 children who were separated from their families under the prior administration's zero humanity policy. However, nearly five years after this cruel and unthinkable policy, today 998 children still remain separated from their parents. And these families and children, including thousands more who have been reunited, continue to grapple with the trauma that the Trump administration inflicted on them. I will never forget meeting with a daughter who had, with a mother who had just been reunited with her young daughter. And the mom said their relationship would never be the same again because border agents lied to her daughter, telling her that her mother had given her up. I will never forget these stories and these voices. And before we launch into another short-sighted and needlessly cruel crackdown on immigrants in the name of border security, we should make sure that the survivors of one of the most devastating and disgusting policies of the prior administration are made whole. I hope my colleagues will accept this simple and common sense amendment. And I yield back. You know, lady yields back. Does the gentleman insist upon his port of order? Point of order is withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Biggs is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, we actually did have hearings about the separated children. I remember it because uh, Chief Board of Chief uh, Carlos Provost came in and we talked to her repeatedly. And she told us of their efforts to reunite and they were making efforts. And I will just tell you, we were talking, and this is it's not acceptable, we're talking a few, thousand, a few thousand children. We're talking last year, CBP encountered 560,000 aliens who claim to be part of a family unit of parents and children. And in just the first five months of this year, that number is already 272,000. It will, it's on pace to clip, eclipse last, last year's number by 100,000. So what happened to the, the, one, the, uh, the ones that we, are talking about that you're uh, are so enraged about yet as we have found them they were offered four hundred fifty thousand dollars in settlement which may or may not be uh, enough in your mind but but when you talk start talking about reckless incompetence i start thinking of numbers like eighty five thousand that's what i think about eighty five thousand children that the Biden administration's crackerjack team has lost contact with. Placed with, who knows, 85,000. When I think of intentional cruelty, I think of a border policy that suggests that, and has turned over our border to the cartels, where when I've been down to the Rio Grande and I've talked to CBP agents, and they tell me 
that the real number of deaths is not fully representative of the deaths that have occurred. Well, why is that? Because they don't count the numbers that the Mexican federales pull out of the river. They don't include those in our numbers. Because of the Biden administration's open borders policies and the Flores settlement, those aliens are, the aliens that I've talked about, these record numbers of aliens are generally released. But they're separated. So what we do is this bill, what it does is it actually keeps families united. The absurdity of the Flores decision is apparent. The practical effect of Flores is that aliens who enter the U.S. with children must be released as a unit or the adults must be detained, which would lead to effective abandonment of the minor. So that's a huge loophole. So we suggest they should stay together. And why, why is that? Well, I think of the time down in Yuma. I was talking to the, the CBP agent who found this. Yes, I they know. had found a young child was being recirculated and rented out over and over again by the cartels who was in this situation. They tracked that and they found that out because just by sheer happenstance, they discovered in North Carolina, excuse me, in South Carolina, Charleston, hundreds of illegal aliens being released that were going to the same address. And they wondered, how can that be? They go and they find this poor 12 year old girl. Thank you. She was ordered and compelled by these, by this uh, cartel member to take care of these smaller children. I believe they were ages five and seven. I think Representative Gates was with me when we, when we saw this. And they were renting them out. This underlying bill prevents that. This is a not a good amendment. I'm gonna yield now to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. I was astonished to hear the gentleman from Arizona say that the number is now $450,000 that the Biden administration is paying to illegal aliens. Now, the, the only circumstance in which illegal aliens should see their net worth rising by $450,000 is if they're given an original Hunter Biden painting <laughs> on their way to being deported. That would be the only acceptable reason. Otherwise, it's a bad deal for taxpayers. I yield back to the chair. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the uh, amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Washington. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Uh, recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Donson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Donson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock. No. Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Benz votes no, Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes no, Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no, Mr. Van Drew. No. Mr. Van Drew votes no, Mr. Nels. No. Mr. Nels votes no, Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no, Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no, Ms. Hageman. No. Ms. Hageman votes no, Mr. Moran. No. Mr. Moran votes no, Ms. Lee. No. Ms. Lee votes no, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes no, Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes no, Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. <laughs> Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye, Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye, Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes aye, Ms. McBath. Mr. Nagoose. Ms. McBath votes aye, Ms. Dean. 
Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Are there any members who wish to vote who have not? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 13 ayes and 23 noes. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Does anyone seek recognition? Mr. Correa, seek recognition. Amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Gentleman reserves a point of order, Ms. McClintock. Substitute to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment deals with a, a group of model immigrants that all of us should be proud to have as our neighbors. I'm talking about immigrants that are either employed or studying, pay taxes, follow and obey all laws, essentially model members of our society. Some are police officers. Others are sheriffs, some are firefighters, others are soldiers serving in our military, others are essential workers, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. My amendment is a simple one. It would strike the text of the bill, the complete text of the bill, and replace it with the Bipartisan Dream Act, passed the last house, better known as HR6, yeah, dude, that ain't supported by nine Republicans. <laughs> It would provide vital protections for more than 3.4 million immigrants, many who have spent their total life in the United States. Americans, including a majority of conservative voters, support a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And 71% of Americans, including 58% of Republican voters, are for protecting and providing a pathway to lawful permanent residence status for dreamers. Heard earlier today, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talking about the fact that we need to take care of those here already in the country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these are productive members of our society, working hard, obeying the laws. And if there's anybody, if there's any group that has earned the opportunity to earn a pathway to citizenship, it's our dreamers. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, the gentleman's amendment would uh, introduce materials beyond the scope and purpose of the bill before us, as much as I would like to debate it, uh, and therefore it violates House Rule 16, Clause 7. Does the sponsor, does the gentleman yield back? Yes. Does the sponsor of the amendment wish to be heard on the point of order? Yes, Mr. Chair. Gentleman is recognized. Simply, this is about immigration, immigration reform. This is essentially in line with the main text of this legislation, the amendment that is now being proposed. I am prepared to rule. The gentleman's amendment does not satisfy the subject matter and fundamental purpose tests, and therefore it is not germane and is out of order. Who seeks recognition? Gentleman from Maryland, recognize. I have an amendment at the desk. I reserve a Point of, order. Point of order is reserved, and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment uh, would amend Title IV to ensure that when children are detained, that they are detained in conditions that are safe and humane. Uh, here are a few of the uh, uh, things that my amendment would do. One, the amendment would ensure that children are transferred to the custody of the Department of Health and Human Services within 72 hours. Uh, second, for those who come into contact with unaccompanied children, the amendment requires training on the best policies, practices, and procedures to care for these children. Three, the amendment provides for the presence of child welfare experts at the border to ensure proper screening and treatment of unaccompanied children. Four, the amendment, the amendment protects girls by requiring women officers to be continuously present during the transfer and transport of unaccompanied immigrant girls. Five, 
uh, for children who are detained. The amendment ensures that they are provided with, among other things, daily nutrition, emergency medical care, uh, personal hygiene and sanitary products, a safe and sanitary living environment, uh, pillows, linens, and sufficient blankets. Six, this amendment ensures that allegations of abuse or mistreatment are referred to the appropriate state and federal child protection authorities. And seven, uh, for those children who are detained, the amendment ensures that they are separated from adults who are not immediate family members, <coughs> excuse me, individuals with criminal convictions, pretrial inmates facing criminal prosecution, and inmates exhibiting violent behavior. In short, the amendment provides just basic protections for the children who are detained and find themselves uh, in, the, uh, in this custody scenario. We're asking for treatment for these kids that is um, you know, certainly better than, than the prisoner of war scenario uh, and you know, just consistent with our basic uh, standards here in the United States and our treatment of children. And with that, I would request the support of my colleagues on this amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? Point of order is withdrawn. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Biggs, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this, this amendment uh, just tries to, I guess, maintain the status quo. I'm trying to understand it in light of uh, maybe suggesting that the uh, the Biden administration is not taking care of children, but if you'd go down and take a look, I mean, I'm thinking of Thank you. what we just saw in the, in the Tucson sector. Uh, they've built a playground. They've got medical professionals there. The fact, I haven't been to a facility along the border in the last year that doesn't have medical uh, personnel there. Yeah. Uh, they're contracting with them. They're receiving appropriate care. Um, they're not, they're not in, in uh, jails, They're, they have open access. They can go get out of uh, their, their areas in Tucson, in fact. They have their, their bed, new bedding, all the beds off the floor. It's, it's hard to believe that, that we're, we're dealing with this, uh, trying to basically go back to a different status quo. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I just urge everyone to vote no and to yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? If not, the question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. <clears throat> Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Massey? Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop? Ms. Sparks? Ms. Sparks votes no. Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Bentz? Mr. Bentz votes no. Mr. Klein? Mr. Klein votes no. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes no. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes no. Mr. Nels. Mr. Nels votes no. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes no. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes no. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes no. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes no. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes no. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Naller votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Aye. Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. Aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Aye. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivey. Aye. Mr. Ivey votes aye. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Chairman. How am I recorded? Mr. Tiffany, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Tiffany votes no.
Clerk will, clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and 23 noes. The amendment is not agreed on, agreed upon. We done? Gentle lady from Texas. Mr. Chairman, uh, earlier today I was unavoidably detained in another committee hearing. I'd like to acknowledge for the record that for the Nadler Amendment, I would have voted aye. The Lofgren Amendment, uh, 02XML, I'm not sure how they're recorded. The Lofgren Amendment, I would have voted aye. Lofgren Amendment, I would have voted aye. 07XML uh, and uh, 01XML, I would have voted aye. Uh, Roy Amendment, I would have voted no. Committee will be in order. We have the gavel. Uh, the Massey Amendment seemed to have voted by voicemail, and the Massey Amendment, uh, I'd like to have those uh, particular uh, notations of how I would have vote, uh, voted for amendments that I was not in the room for because I was unavoidably detained reflected in the record. Ask unanimous consent. Without objection. I yield back. Question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. This will be followed immediately immediately by a vote on uh, reporting the bill. All, All right, those in favor it. say aye. Aye. After these two votes here, this is the last final amendment, then the whole bill. And then as long as they don't go home for the night, we're doing our spot now. From being present, the question is on favorably reporting the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to roll the House. Call. Members will have two days to submit views. Roll call being requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes yes. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz votes aye. Yes. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Gooden votes aye. Mr. Van Drew. Yes. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels. Yes. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes yes. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Committee Mr. will be in order. Committee will be in order. Yes. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes yes. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes yes. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff. No. Mr. Schiff votes no. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes no. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagus. Proud to join my friend Tom Massey in voting no. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes no. Ms. Dean. Ms. Escobar. Ain't that Ms. right. Escobar votes no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. How we doing, brother? Mr. Ivy. No. Mr. Ivy votes no. Any members who haven't voted who wish to vote? Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 15 noes. Um, the ayes have it. And the bill is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute incorporating all the adopted amendments and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. I want to thank all the members for the work on that bill. But pursuant to notice, I call up H.J. Resolution 44 for purposes of markup and move that the committee reported favorably to the House. 
The clerk will report the resolution. Here we go. H.J. Res. 44, providing for congressional disapproval under Chapter 8 of Title 5. Without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The chair recognizes himself for an opening statement. The Congressional Review Act requires agencies to submit a rule to Congress before the rule can take effect. After submission of a rule by the agency, Congress has 60 days to introduce and pass a resolution of disapproval under expedited procedures. Today, we are considering H.J. Res. 44, which provides for congressional disapproval of the rules submitted by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives relating to factoring criteria for firearms with attached stabilizing braces. On January 31st, 2023, the ATF issued a final rule titled Factoring criteria for firearms with attached stabilized braces that effectively bans pistol stabilizing braces nationwide. That rule redefined a firearm with an attached stabilizing brace as a short barreled rifle subject to the regulation under the Gun Control Act of 1968 and the National Firearms Act of 1934. The rule directly contradicts the prior 2012 determination made during the Obama administration on which law abiding firearm owners relied on for a decade that a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace would not, again, would not be subject to the National Firearms Act's controls. The rule will require the owners of roughly 40 million firearms with stabilizing braces in circulation to obtain a special res registration surrender or destroy their brace by the compliance date or face criminal penalties as a result of this regulatory change. It actually make them a felon if they don't do that. This isn't a law that Congress passed or a ruling from a judge. Rather, it is a decision from an unnamed and unaccountable bureaucrat to turn law-abiding Americans into felons with the stroke of a pen. As the duly elected representatives of our constituents, we cannot sit idly by and allow executive branch bureaucrats to make law that impacts millions of Americans. This rule usurps the legislative power of this body. I urge my colleagues to support the resolution and recognize the ranking member now for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, gun violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every single day. It changes how safe we feel in our schools and in our houses of worship. It reduces vibrant cities to somber headlines. It takes our loved ones, old and young, and leaves us with another anniversary of lives cut short and the community forever changed. Three weeks ago, six more people, including three children, were killed in a mass shooting at a school in Nashville. It was a 19th school shooting just this year. Three weeks ago, three more families woke up without the child that they took to school the day before. Six more families faced the unthinkable, that their son, their daughter, their parent, their husband, their wife, or their sibling, are one of the 100 Americans we lose every day to gun violence. And Mr. Chairman, the United States is the only nation on the face of the earth which has these systematic mass shootings. And three weeks ago, the majority had planned to mark up this very legislation, a bill to make stabilizing braces widely available without a background check, even though they'd already been used in mass shootings in Dayton, Boulder, and Colorado Springs. When it was revealed that the shooter in Nashville also used the gun with a stabilizing brace, the Republicans canceled the markup until now. Today, the majority has decided that enough time has passed and six lives were lost in yet another mass shooting with a stabilizing brace. Perhaps they think that we have forgotten the lives lost in that terrible tragedy, but we will never forget them or the countless others who lose their lives to gun violence every day. Today, rather than stand up against gun violence, the majority has called this markup so that they can yet again stand with the gun industry. Rather than support the law enforcement officers who are on the front lines of protecting our communities, the majority is attempting to weaken law enforcement by rolling back a rule created by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives meant to protect us from dangerous weapons. ATF is the law enforcement agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands and keeping our gun laws in line with congressional intent through rulemaking. In 1934, Congress passed the National Firearms Act creating additional requirements to own certain specially, especially dangerous firearms, like short-barreled rifles, which were widely used by violent criminals. Congress included short-barreled rifles because they combined the firepower of a rifle with the concealability of a smaller gun. 
But in recent years, the gun industry discovered a way to circumvent the restrictions of the National Firearms Act by selling stabilizing braces, an accessory that allows a pistol to be fired from the shoulder, turning it into a deadly yet concealable short-barreled rifle. In 2020, under the Trump administration, the ATF concluded that stabilizing braces were being widely used to create short-barreled rifles and to publish guidance regarding their use. But House Republicans cried foul. Just four days after the guidance was published, 90 House Republicans sent a letter to ATF and DOJ expressing their opposition. And just a few days later, the guidance was withdrawn. A few months later, under the Biden administration, the ATF revived its efforts to regulate stabilizing braces and it published the final rule in January to ensure that our laws stay in line with the intent of Congress dating all the way back to 1934, when Congress decided that deadly concealable short-barreled rifles should be subject to heightened regulation. But Republicans will stop at nothing to block the ATF from taking this simple life-saving measure. Mass shooters used guns with stabilizing braces to kill nine people outside a bar in Dayton in 2019. To kill 10 people, including a responding police officer at a grocery store in Boulder in 2021. To kill five people in an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs in 2022. And to kill six people at a school in Nashville just three weeks ago. How many more people have to die before Republicans acknowledge that these weapons are a favorite of mass shooters for their ability to make a gun both deadly and concealable? How many more people have to die before Republicans will value the lives of our children over the profits of the gun industry? All of them. Last Congress, Democrats put forth a range of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve violent crimes. But our colleagues across the aisle continue to push for unfettered access to every firearm and accessory imaginable. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulation, we will continue to see communities free from gun violence. I urge my colleagues to oppose this dangerous legislation. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman who seeks rec uh, gentleman from Kentucky is recognized, Mr. Massey. Thomas Massey. Here we go. The most disingenuous or uninformed thing that will be said tonight about this issue is that banning a four ounce piece of plastic is going to save lives. It, it will not save a single life. So let's not say that you're not even this doesn't ban a gun, this ATF rule. It bans a piece of plastic that goes on a gun. It looks similar to something that won't be banned, which is a, a collapsible stock. There will be 100 million collapsible stocks still legally obtainable in this country. But this isn't a collapsible stock. It just happens to look like one. It was designed for pistols, for people who have disabilities so that they can stabilize a pistol and shoot it from their wrist. And let's be clear, you, the other side of the aisle had two years when they controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. They could have made a law against this particular plastic accessory, but they chose not to. Instead, this is a ruling from the ATF, a ruling that in just a few weeks is going to create tens of millions of felons who have no idea that they're going to be felons. And there will be prosecutions. And these people followed the law when they purchased these items. The law that they could go look up and read a law that the ATF interpreted for them, sent letters to the manufacturers and the purchasers of these things and said that these plastic accessories are legal. Under our technical interpretation of what this plastic accessory does, it is legal to buy, it is legal to sell, it is legal to transfer. In fact, nobody even needed a license. It's a plastic accessory. This thing can't shoot a bullet. It doesn't function like a gun. It is a plastic accessory. Is it a bump stock? <laughs> I'm glad you asked this question, Mr. Gates. It is not a bump stock. It does not 
simulate or, or accelerate rapid fire of a firearm. In fact, it makes a pistol less concealable. A, a pistol regularly wouldn't have this thing on it. It is something you add to a pistol that makes it less concealable. And under the law, it is legal because it was designed not with the intent to allow a pistol to be fired from the shoulder, but with the intent to allow somebody who's weak and can't file, fire a pistol from the wrist to be able to more accurately fire a pistol from the wrist. So it doesn't even meet the definition, the legal definition of, of what would be a stock added to a pistol. It is a pistol brace for the wrist. And let's be clear, people had 120 days to comply with this. this. This isn't even in the news. A lot of people bought these. They're in their safes. They're in their houses. They have no idea that on May 1st, May 1st, if we don't do something, on May 1st, there will be tens of millions of felons who have no idea that they've just become felons. May 31st. The ATF did something like this. Uh, in 1994, they reclassified what was called the Striker 12 shotgun, street sweeper. They changed it to a destructive device. There were only a few thousand of these guns. They gave people seven years to register these guns. Those were guns, by the way, not plastic accessories. And they gave them seven years to do this. By the way, the bump stock ban, there were probably half a million of those in existence. Something similar happened with those. How many of those do you think have been registered? About 500, about 500. Because a lot of people don't even know that they are felons in possession of that at this point because of a rule, not because of a law, because of a rule. Yes, the ATF accepted comment, but they really didn't do much about the comment or the concerns. And what, what this boils down to is what was your intent when you purchase this plastic accessory. They're trying to impart crime based on intent, and that's what this rule does. This rule is flawed. This rule will create millions of felons. We need to stop this rule. Mr. Clyde's Congressional Review Act needs to be implemented quickly to prevent creating tens of millions of felons on June 1st. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We seek recognition of the gentlelady from Texas. Ms. Jackson Lee. Certainly, the first thing I'd like to say is Mr. Clyde's legislation never needs to be enacted. Never. <laughs> uh, and I rise to strike the last word. Nashville, Louisville, Alabama. That is the story of which we tell today. That is the backdrop in which we try to plead for common sense. It is the backdrop of the people who still mourn in Texas for the children in Uvalde. Their pictures are behind me. It is the pictures of those mass shootings involving stabilizing braces. It doesn't kill. It doesn't harm. They were killed, including those in Nashville. Last month, less than a month after the tragedy of the shooting at the Covenant School in Nashville, Republicans convened their markup to oppose regulation of stabilizing braces. One of the modifications, the shooter used to blast their way into the school and murder three nine-year-olds and three staff members. After this shooting occurred, the committee postponed the markup out of embarrassment. That's all that happens, embarrassment, not any action. For some reason, which I do not claim to know, Republicans didn't want to talk about stabilizing braces, but today they're ready to do so. And yet these people are dead by stabilizing braces. Apparently 22 days have cooled it down and they think people have forgotten. Two representatives were expelled from a ridiculous state legislature in Tennessee Gladly they were returned because they stood up against the devastation of gun violence. On Monday during the sham of the hearing in Manhattan, when we tried to vote 
or to discuss both victims of crime, which I strongly believe we should be standing with, but we should work hard to decrease the number of victims of crimes. We couldn't get anyone to talk about it then. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death among children, while an average of 70 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. The most dangerous call for police is a domestic violence call. I know it. In our work in the Violence Against Women Act, over and over again, the numbers came up on domestic violence calls. I lost a dear friend, a police officer, a neighbor, to a domestic violence call where he saved the mother and son, but he was shot dead along with his partner who was wounded. And every day of the more than 300 people who are shot, more than 100 of them will die. In the average year, guns account for roughly two thirds of homicides. However, in 2020, 77% of murders involve firearms. Despite these appalling numbers, state statistics, state and uh, congressional Republicans aided and abetted by extreme rulings of the federal judiciary and Roberts Court in favor of possessing and carrying firearms, along with states like Texas that have the bless you criminals day, happy birthday to criminals, make sure you get an open carry uh, non-permitted guns. Have a celebration. But the families of these people are suffering. And this stabilizing rule does nothing to create millions of, if you will, felons. This rule only affects stabilizing braces that are designed to make and intended to be fired from the shoulder when they are attached to a firearm with a barrel less than six inches because this creates a short uh, barreled rifle. The rule will not instantly create thousands and millions of felons. The ATF has thousands provided several million. options for owners of stabilizing braces attached to firearms with a barrel under 16 inches to comply with the rule. And 120 days, these people wish they had 120 days. Oh, Jesus. These parents wish they had their children for another 120 days. How long do we have to come into this room? We got a little tired. We've been going all day. I'm no ways tired. No ways. Because it is absolutely insane. We govern this nation. We are the people's representative. And the people of the United States have said they want an ban on assault weapons. And I'll tell you if you ask the man on the street about whether or not he cares a heck about a brace, a stabilizing brace. First, he'll say, what is it? Then when I tell him it killed all these people, he will say, and you haven't done anything yet? Gentlelady's time is My colleagues, I time hope that expired. you will vote against this legislation to save lives. I thank the gentleman for his graciousness. I only ask him to lead the fight. Gentlelady's to end time is expired. Gun carnage. The gentleman from California. Is I yield back. I thank the chairman. I move to strike the last word. That was recognized. You know, I, I know that we've been here a long time, but this is an important issue. And any time that longstanding uh, decisions are reversed for political purposes, we do have a reason to act, and that's why we're acting. I'd uh, yield to the uh, gentleman from Kentucky. I thank the gentleman from California. Let me repeat this. When I said it at first, I didn't know how often it would be repeated by the other side of the aisle, but the most disingenuous or uninformed thing that will be said tonight in this debate is that banning a four ounce piece of plastic is going to save lives. And th it's been said that, well, you can just register this piece of plastic with the existing firearm as a short barrel rifle. Well, do you think registration is going to stop these crimes? All of the crimes that have been mentioned tonight were, were committed by people who could legally register these things anyway. The registration they pass background checks. The registration is not going to save lives. But what it will do, because millions of people don't know that by June 1st, they have to be registered, it will create felons. Don't tell me on the other side of the aisle, there won't be at least 10 million felons who could be convicted on June 1st, because there will be. And by the way, it said, oh, just register it as a, a short barreled rifle. Guess what? 26% 20 of Americans live in a state where you can't own a short barrel rifle. 
So the ATF has proposed a solution for 26% of Americans that's actually illegal in their own state by reclassifying a firearm with this four ounce piece of plastic on it as something that has to be registered as if it was a machine gun, as if it were a silencer. It doesn't, you can't even fire a bullet. You're not going to, the ATF rule will not save a single life. And let me talk about something else. Regulatory agencies, I know the Supreme Court has given a lot of deference day 120. To, to regulatory agencies to implement uh, regulations to interpret laws. We are not talking about regulations that will impose civil penalties on corporations for exceeding parts per million sulfur dioxide in their emissions. Okay, these are not civil infractions that they have created. These are felons that have been created through regulation through uh, by an agency who for years, a decade, has said this is legal. So they've flip-flopped on this. This is actually the second time they've flip-flopped on it. But they're flip-flopping on it now, and they are in the process with this rulemaking authority that they claim to have going to create millions of felons. And I know my, my colleague, Mr. Ivey, earlier in our debate uh, was concerned in the, in the sense, in the context of immigration, that people could become criminals, but they wouldn't have the intent or the knowledge. That's what's going to happen in this situation is people are going to become criminals on June 1st because May 31st is the deadline without the intent or the knowledge that they are committing a felony that the ATF created by by interpreting a rule, and this isn't this isn't some small felony. It's like ten or twenty years, and and you know over a hundred thousand dollar fine for not registering this piece of plastic on a firearm as a as a uh, National Firearms Act weapon. People do not have any idea. Millions of people have no idea this is going to happen. And uh, again, let me just say this one more time, because I don't, I don't, I don't think it's disingenuous from the other side of the aisle, and I, and I don't want to impugn their motives. I think it's just highly uninformed to think that they will save lives because these things now require a piece of paper and a two hundred dollar tax with the federal government that that will save lives. It's not going to save a single life, and I'm and I'm sorry that that's be, that myth is being perpetuated here. And I yield back to to Mr. Issa from California. And I thank the gentleman for his eloquent explanation of why, as you called it, flip flopping is so inappropriate. We give deference to agencies once we've written law, but we cannot okay. allow the political activity of simply deciding under one administration to do one thing and on the other to do the opposite. And for that reason, we must act. And I thank the gentleman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I hear I and see uh, tears about uh, the number of felons who are allegedly going to be created if this uh, legislation does not pass. Uh, but I don't hear or see a single tear for any of the children who lose their lives annually to gun violence in this country. Firearms are the leading cause of death of our children here in America. And it's uh, no coincidence that just over the last three months of this year, we've broken all kinds of records in terms of mass shootings, which are uh, defined as shootings where four or more people lose their lives. We've had more in the first three months of this year than ever before. It's like climate change. Mm. I just, that doesn't exist either. Months on record, the highest number of gun deaths on record, and our children are dying, and we're talking about felons being created because of a four ounce piece of plastic, as it's been described as just an innocuous piece of plastic that they call it a stabili stabilizing brace. Well, that's an innocuous sounding uh, name for a four ounce piece of plastic, but actually what this is is a, uh, is a, 
it's not a harmless plastic accessory. It's a plastic, it's a portable shoulder stock that can be detached easily from a large format pistol like an AR-15 or an AK-47. You can, you can attach it, turn it into essentially a uh, short barreled rifle. <laughs> now, short barreled rifles are uh, regulated under the uh, National Firearms Act of 1934. The country's history has been one of regulating rifles, these kinds of uh, uh, instruments of, of war. But we've seen continued promiscuity, promiscuity <laughs> with respect to firearms in this country. And it's leading to more and more and more deaths, particularly of our children. And it's because we continue to pump out new and improved weapons of war. The, the thing that this is gonna do is to allow a short barrel pistol to, to be put in one pocket what? And, a, uh, and a portable shoulder stock, also known as a, uh, a stabilizing brace in the other pocket. A person can then walk into a place, a movie theater, a church, synagogue, mosque, bowling alley, movie theater, school, with a fully concealed short barrel rifle that does the damage of a battlefield weapon in seconds. <laughs> so it's making it easier to do mass killings in America. That's what this four ounce piece of plastic is doing. And until we start closing the door on making firearms more deadly, you know, we're going to continue to see new and improved versions of killing machines. Is that what we really want in this country? And then to bemoan the fact that 40 million uh, portable shoulder stock uh, devices, as the chairman mentioned, 40 million. It's a tragedy to deprive 40 million people of their four ounce piece of plastic. Um, when this in fact was something, it was a pistol brace at one time. It was originally built as a pistol brace for the disabled, but it quickly morphed into a portable shoulder stock once the loophole was discovered. And now we've got a flood of these weapons. They're actually short barreled rifle converters. They're actually uh, large format pistol converters into short barreled rifles, uh, killing machines. When are we gonna get, when are we gonna start closing the door instead of opening the door even wider and getting rid of the door and just blasting a hole into the entire structure to allow Mack trucks to get through of these uh, high-powered weapons that are affecting our children's lives. Let's vote no on this and let's do some common sense uh, regulation of these high-powered weapons. And with time, that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen, the floor is recognized. I agree with our Democrat colleagues that we have to focus on the victims of crime. And boy, did we get an earful from some of them in Manhattan earlier this week. What I heard from victims from crime is that they observe the soft on crime policies pushed by Democrats as far more dangerous than law abiding gun owners who work to keep our community safe. One of our witnesses even talked about being a good guy with a gun, being somebody able to provide for self-defense and the righteous defense of others. And, and I heard in that hearing a term I had never heard before from the Democrat witness a crime gun. So I guess there are guns and crime guns. And I was left wondering what makes a gun a crime gun. And I think it's that it's in the hands of a criminal <laughs> committing a crime. The very criminals the Democrats seem quite willing to turn out on our streets time and time again. We heard the Democrat witness at a joint hearing between the Judiciary Committee and the Oversight Committee invited by Democrats say that these braces make guns more powerful and more lethal. And it was the laugh line of the hearing and summarily rejected by experts. 
But what this rule proves is that the Biden administration and Democrats are intent to weaponize the ATF in order to erode the Second Amendment and take away constitutional rights from otherwise law-abiding Americans. And they intend to do so without the approval of the Congress. Gentleman yield. And what undermines the passion for my Democrat colleagues is that when they had the ability to do this in law, when they had unified control of the government, they didn't do it. And so when they really come for your rights and when they really want to erode the Constitution, they don't do it with folks who can be sent home by the voters. They do it with unelected bureaucrats with green eye shade somewhere in some windowless cubicle in the bowels of the ATF. Will the gentleman yield? The ATF has abused its rulemaking authority in attempting to regulate stabilizing braces. And these braces were invented by Alex Brosco, a U.S. Marine Corps and Army veteran, to help disabled combat veterans better control and safely fire guns at shooting ranges. I represent many of these disabled veterans in my district, and I can tell you the extent to which the opportunity to engage in competitive shooting is a mental health enhancer. It's what keeps people engaged. I worry about the number of veteran suicides we may see increase mm -hmm. at an already totally unacceptable level if we were to take this away and take this mental health tool away. The ATF's decision also contradicted its own prior to, uh, 2012 determination made during the Obama administration, not known as particularly kind to gun owners. And that was a decision that was relied upon by gun owners for a decade, that they would not be subject to the National Firearms Control Act with the purchase of this stabilizing brace. Now the ATF's rule will require the owners of roughly 40 million stabilizing braces in circulation to obtain some special registration, surrender or destroy their brace by the compliance date, or face severe criminal penalties. And what I can tell you is these will be enforced. I am increasingly aware of circumstances in my district where almost anyone involved in the firearms industry, they are seeing the ATF show up with crazy demands and enforcement that goes beyond what we would normally consider from a government agency simply trying to seek compliance. My friends, this is part of a comprehensive attack on the Second Amendment, and this legislation would vindicate at least those who require the stabilizing brace. And while we all share the desire to reduce the frequency of gun violence, there is no evidence to suggest that these stabilizing braces contribute to it. And, and it is rather rich that we're now hearing from our Democrat colleagues about uh, the stabilizing braces, because when there was legislation that they proposed that they couldn't get passed in the Senate, they told us that stabilizing braces could convert, wep could convert weapons into bump stocks. And what, what a revealing moment that was. I, I yield my final moments to my colleague from Kentucky. Well, the gentleman from Florida is correct. These are not shoulder stocks, as the other side says. There's two ways we know they're not shoulder stocks. One, the legal definition of a shoulder stock says design and intended to be fired from the shoulder. These were not designed or intended to be fired from the shoulder. They were intended to be fired from the wrist. The other way we know they're not shoulder stocks is for a decade the ATF said they were not. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, gentleman from... Rhode Island, Mr. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two weeks ago, Nashville was the 13th school shooting to result in injury or death in 2023 and the 89th gun incident to take place on school grounds this year. This happens so often that I fear too many Americans are becoming numb to it. So numb that my colleagues sit here doing everything in their power to protect their unlimited access to guns while we do nothing to protect our children from being slaughtered in their classrooms. Guns are the leading cause of death in ch for children in America. Abortion. That's a disgrace. Abortion. And we're not powerless to do anything about it. We sit here today, we're taking aim at the ATF, an agency created in part to protect Americans from gun violence. My colleagues are so obsessed with dismantling all gun restrictions in this country that they're fighting to allow gun manufacturers to continue exploiting a loophole in stabilizing brace regulations that makes weapons more dangerous. Claims that braces that allow a pistol to be fired from the shoulder aren't dangerous or don't change the gun are disingenuous at best and outright lies at worst. Let me be, put it plainly. Allowing a pistol to be fired from the shoulder creates a short-barreled rifle.
And these highly powerful weapons have been recognized as extremely dangerous and have been heavily regulated in this country since 1934. And the industry knows this. Just watch this video for yourself. Mr. Chairman, I asked the clock stop. All of, okay, it's on. Never mind. You see a gun like this, and you're like, how the heck is a barrel with that length a pistol? Well, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about SB Tactical and their stabilizing braces for pistols. And the end here, which is a rubber right, um, type of configuration. It's adjustable if you want to run your arm through it and do so you can and tighten it down to your forearm, which of course is what the braces were originally intended for. Um, however, you know, with the ATF rulings, now you can occasionally accidentally fire in front of your shoulder. And today on Sunday Gear Review, I want to talk to you about this SB Tactical HK PDW arm brace. It does help some people, right? So you could slide your arm through that and undo it and all that stuff. But we all know what these are actually used for and nobody is wondering about that. Okay? And we're going to just see, like, uh, does it really feel like a stock, even though it's not a stock? Back to this brace, it changes the game. Like I said, it, it gives you four points of contact with the occasional shoulder. That's awesome. Got it loaded up. Let's see the difference. Now you've got a very shorty boy, right? So you can put this guy obviously in a, a briefcase if you wanted to, in a backpack. Great, great, great. That's great. These so-called stabilizing braces are being actively sold and used to make pistols and just short barrel rifles, and everyone knows it. You just saw it for yourself how this works. This is not about providing tools to disabled people who want to shoot firearms, many of whom are veterans. And my colleague said there's 10 to 15 million people who they described as weak who need these to shoot. We know that's not what's going on here. These braces are not that. They're manipulation by the gun lobby and gun sellers to skirt regulations on short barrel rifles and increase their sales because they make these firearms more lethal, more accurate, and easier to conceal. Shootings and major, major shootings have exploited this loophole in Dayton, Boulder, Colorado Springs, and most recently in Nashville. Who knows how many more murderers will do the same if we don't use our common sense and end this loophole, which is exactly what the ATF is doing with this rule. Joint Resolution 44 puts all Americans in danger of even deadlier shootings, such as the Q Club shooting, where a stabilizing brace helped the shooter kill five people and injured 19 more in an LGBTQ club. Once again, you think all of these mass shooters that result in the deaths of all these people just put on these braces because it, they felt like giving some money to the plastic industry? They did it because it made the weapon more effective, more accurate, and more lethal. You saw it in the video. Stop the charade. Leave the ATF alone so we can stop this dangerous killing of our constituents. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll just be brief. I, I remember in Judiciary in the 117th Congress, we had a uh, similar discussion and a similar debate. And quite honestly, I, a lot of the members had no idea kind of what we were talking about or how the nomenclature of any type of firearm uh, can be changed or the uniqueness in and around it, or that the caliber and certainly the ability uh, to to uh, utilize any type of firearm uh, it is uh, sometimes in just the, the eye of the beholder. Um, and, you know, there are many people that I know, including members of my family, that, uh, that utilize uh, many different uh, types of rifles for, you know, the nine day gun season for deer hunting in Wisconsin, in which over 400,000 individuals go safely into the woods uh, for nine days and, uh, and hopefully get a deer. So it's, it's once again, I just wanted to remind the committee that uh, you can focus on the tragedies that have happened across this nation, uh, but also you have to remember those that continually uh, on a regular basis are gun owners and should be protected by the second amendment. The focus of this discussion that we have continued to have, Congress after Congress, is misplaced. And, and I think that, that that just had to be brought forth again this evening. Well, gentlemen, I yield. would yield gentlemen back. Yield. Gentlemen, yield. yield.
yielded. Sure. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I just I am. I think we're making it too complicated. This is, as Mr. Massey said, a four ounce plastic accessory created for disabled veterans by a veteran now used by approximately 40 million Americans. And 10 years ago in five months, November 26, 2012, the ATF said, just fine, no problem. Now here they are 10 years later, changing their mind, and they just did it. We didn't do it, as Mr. Massey pointed out. Democrats had the Congress last two years. They passed a bunch of gun legislation through this committee. They could have done this. They didn't do it. The ATF did it. No bill that came to committee, no bill that went to the House floor, no bill that went to the Senate, no bill signed by the president. They just did it. And now 40 million Americans, if you don't destroy the brace, destroy the gun, get a longer bail, barrel or register your firearm, you're a felon. And as Mr. Massey pointed out, a bunch of Americans don't even know it. They don't even know. They're in some states where they, they can't. It, it, that's the problem. So we can, you guys can introduce the legislation if you want, but we should get rid of this rule that is going to cause so much harm to so many Americans, many of them, the, the type of Americans that Mr. Fitzgerald just described, who like to hunt, particularly deer hunt in Wisconsin. That's how simple this is. Do it the right way. Pass it through Congress if you want to do it. Don't chip away at the Second Amendment by having bureaucrats do it. The ATF do it when 10 years ago in five months they said it was just fine. Yield back to the gentleman from Wisconsin. I uh, yield back, Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. I thank the chairman uh, and move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. 23 days, that is apparently how long it takes for my Republican colleagues to move on from the tragedy of the shooting in Nashville, during which three nine-year-old children and three adults were slaughtered in their school. We were supposed to hold this mark up the very next day, but Republicans pulled it down at the last moment, likely knowing how callous it would seem if they decided to proceed with the markup as planned, or maybe thinking that we would forget what took place in Nashville, the country would forget, but we haven't forgotten. The parents and loved ones of those victims haven't forgotten. Evelyn Deakhouse and William Kinney and Haley Scruggs were children. We haven't forgotten them. Now, I've heard several arguments by my colleagues about essentially why we should make it easier to kill children, why we should refuse to take any step to make it more difficult to kill children in a, in a mass shooting like we've seen time after time after time. And let me just see if I can articulate some of those arguments. One is you don't understand guns. You don't understand guns. Well, I'll tell you this. We understand biology. We understand what a high capacity round does to a child's body. We understand what multiple rounds of an assault weapon projectile can do to tear flesh from the bone. Isn't that enough understanding? What we don't understand is your blind allegiance to the NRA. What we don't understand is why even the majority of NRA members who support assault weapon bans, why you don't support them? It's not even about the members of the NRA, of course. It's, I guess, about their organizational support or, or who knows what. We don't understand that blind allegiance to the NRA. Another argument we hear from our colleagues on the other side of the aisle is because the law won't stop all gun violence, it's just not worth doing. If we can't save all lives, it's not worth saving a single life. Well, I suppose that that logic works until that single life is your own, or maybe it's your child. But why is it so under, hard to step into the shoes of someone who's lost a loved one from gun violence? Don't you think we would feel differently if that had happened to one of our family? And finally, we hear the argument that nothing really works. No gun safety laws really work. Nothing works. We're powerless. And so we don't have to do anything. But of course, when you look at other countries that have enacted laws, they have made their people more safe. There's a reason why the United States is alone in the world with the magnitude of gun violence. 
there are, in fact, things we can do that provably make our country more safe and better protect the lives of our children. We just don't have the will. We just don't have the courage. And so we, we see gun tragedy after gun tragedy after gun tragedy. Our colleagues say these braces were created to help disabled veterans shoot more easily. That may have been the purpose behind the original brace, but those braces now are modified by manufacturers transforming a pistol into more concealable and deadly assault weapon. They're used to evade even the most porous of background systems, but even that is not enough. I've introduced legislation to strip away the gun industry's immunity from liability, a immunity that no other industry enjoys. That immunity was extent, extended not just to the industry, but to the NRA itself. But that's too much for my colleagues who think that, no, the gun industry alone ought to enjoy the ability to act negligently without repercussion. I am so sick of seeing these constant tragedies, of seeing these grieving parents. I'm so fed up with the lack of courage here. When one of you accepts the, the necessity of a ban on assault weapons immediately within days, as our former colleague from near Buffalo was forced to resign or forced to say he wouldn't run for re-election because that was the end of his chances. We could do better this, we have to do better this. I'm sick of doing nothing. I'm sick of thoughts and prayers and, and the slaughter continues. We are not powerless to do something here. If we had a little courage, we could save lives. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt, is recognized. Who's right the last word? As a father of three young children, I'm deeply wounded by the horrific tragedy that we saw in Nashville. We saw the lives of six people taken, three young children. The shooting was reported to police at 10.13 a.m., and the suspect was shot by two Nashville police officers at 10.27 a.m. This quick response time saved countless lives is a testament to law enforcement, and we thank them every single day. As a congressman, I want to do everything in my power to protect children all around this country from experiencing something like that again. Unlike my colleagues on the left, I'm different, and I think an actual solution to protect our children is not what's being proposed by the left, nor is it political. It is a clear attempt to erode the Second Amendment rights for law-abiding citizens and AR-15 owners like myself. Every time I walk around this Capitol, I feel extremely safe. I've deployed multiple times. I've been on multiple bases. I think to myself, oh my goodness, hot damn. I don't have to really worry about anything because I'm surrounded by people with guns that want to keep me safe. We have barricades, multiple checkpoints, metal detectors, we are staffed by two or four police officers at all times. All day, there was a gentleman standing at this door in case somebody entered this room with a gun. The U.S. Capitol Police is comprised of more than 2,000 officers and over 350 civilian employees who provide operational and administrative support that has an annual budget of approximately $460 million. And for some of my colleagues, that's still not enough because they have their own private security on top of that, surrounded by people that carry guns. And I can assure you that the people here on the Hill are well protected. What about our school children? This is not a round. This is a pen. Now, one of my staffers tried to bring this pen to my office, and he was stopped by a metal detector, and it went through the x-ray machine, and he was almost tackled by our police services right here at the Capitol, doing their jobs, of, of course. And we proved that, of course, it was a pen. If a pen that looks like this can't get to my office, then how does a homicidal maniac that has weapons walk into a school 
and arbitrarily murder innocent children. Because we wear this pin, that does not make us more important than our children. There's a private school in Houston, Texas, and I was there a few months ago, and I was giving a young man his appointment to West Point. I drove on the campus, and I was met by two armed guards. There were parking places that were just for visitors, and they had even more armed guards beyond that. I felt very secure as I drove onto this school. The headmaster head of school, she met me in the front, and I said, my God, ma'am, I feel very secure in this place. What's the, what's the secret here? She said, Wesley, actually, given my religious beliefs, I hate guns. I don't do guns. But it's my responsibility to keep these young people safe. It's not about how I feel about guns or what I think about them or what I do or don't know. I must keep these children safe because they are the most precious things that we have on this earth. I keep hearing this word AR-15s and, and a weapon of war. I find that funny because, well, I've, I've been to war. And you should Google the AA-64 Delta Apache helicopter. That is what I would call a true weapon of war. But I feel people calling these things a weapon of war, but they've never been to war. They don't know what war is. And they're using the AR-15 as a scapegoat for everything. I say that. Because according to the ATF, 6%, 6% of homicides are at the hands of AR-15s, 60% at the hands of handguns. So if you really want to have an intellectually honest conversation about homicide reduction, you will go after pistols. But you don't do that. Because you want to go after the AR-15 first to then eventually get to the pistol to disarm Americans yeah. to infringe on our Second Amendment rights. Yeah. I want you to know something. It ain't the gun. It's the homicidal maniac. The deadliest days in this country, 9-11, not a single shot was fired. Timothy McVeigh, fertilizer, Oklahoma City. The Boston Marathon, pressure cookers. Not a single shot was fired. I know what war looks like. Yep. But what I do want to say is we have got to agree that we can all protect our children. And we should not be protected more than them. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady uh, is recognized. Thank you. Every day, most of us are horrified by another mass shooting, whether in Nashville, Louisville, Alabama, Maine, to name just a few of the most recent. Americans, my friends, my neighbors, my constituents are afraid to go to shopping malls, to theaters, to church. Children tell us they're afraid to go to school and while they're in school, they're being traumatized by active shooter and stop the bleed drills. In response, Republicans on this committee are not trying to limit access to deadly weapons by violent people. Instead, they've chosen to pass a measure it would make it easier for mass shooters to obtain and conceal deadly firearms. At issue tonight is an ATF rule that closes a loophole by which people can use a stabilizing brace to convert a large format pistol into a short-barreled rifle while evading the restrictions placed on short-barreled rifles since the enactment of the National Firearms Act in 1934. In recent years, mass shooters have deployed these armed braces in numerous tragedies. A Dayton, Ohio bar, a Boulder, Colorado grocery store, Club Q in Colorado Springs, and most recently at the Nashville school shooting just a few days ago. As we saw in the video played by Mr. Cicilline, firearms manufacturers are marketing and selling these braces as a way to evade the special restrictions. No, no, created by the National first. Firearms Act to regulate access to these particularly deadly weapons. And those firearms manufacturers have successfully invested the millions of dollars that they've made from those sales in political contributions. Our Republican colleagues called this markup in order to kneecap the ATF, and they've declared they'll fight every effort to do something, anything, to prevent carnage in our schools, our grocery stores, our workplaces, and community spaces. The Second Amendment is not a suicide pact. 
all constitutional rights are subject to qualifications or limitations when their extremist application would infringe upon the rights and freedoms of others. Even conservative justices on our Supreme Court have conceded that the Constitution permits the restrictions on the types of weapons that can be sold and to whom they may be sold. We all should be working together to prevent violent people from obtaining dangerous weapons in order to ensure domestic tranquility and promote the general welfare as we're urged to do by our Constitution. It's abundantly and tragically clear that we have a lot of work to do to keep our kids and our communities safe as the firearms industry and its political allies continue to prioritize profits and their gun fetish over people. We have to stop wasting time and pass common sense gun safety policies that save lives and give our children a brighter future. And does anyone? Yes, I would yield to Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, asked just moments ago why we are so concerned about assault-style weapons, even though this uh, resolution obviously is not about assault-style weapons. So I'd like to answer that question, that, uh, that what was a rhetorical question. In El Paso on August 3rd, 2019, a gunman, a white supremacist, drove 10 miles in order, I'm sorry, 10 hours in order to slaughter Mexicans and immigrants, and he had an assault style weapon. This was three years ago, and my constituents who uh, were victims of that, who survived, still have to deal with surgeries, still have to deal with physical therapy, still carry the emotional and the physical trauma that came with an assault style weapon that ravaged their bodies, those bullets, those guns are not intended for a bullet to just go right through a body. Those bullets obliterate a body. They obliterate muscle. They obliterate nerves. They obliterate tendons. They obliterate bones. That's why we are so concerned by assault weapons. Thank you, Ms. Scan Scanlon, I yield back. Lady yields back the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Nels is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Folks, it appears to me that the, the gentleman who leads the ATF, the director of the ATF, is unqualified to do so, and let me explain why. Yesterday, the ATF director, Steve Dentelbeck, testified in front of our colleagues on the House Appropriations Committee his poster board, there he is, that fella right there. When asked if he could define what an assault weapon was, I mean, it's been said several times on the other side, what an assault weapon was, Mr. Dettelbuck, the sole man responsible for leading an agency charged with enforcing the laws and regulations related to firearms in the United States of America, said, I quote, unlike you, I am not a firearms expert to the same extent as you may be, end quote. Let me say that again. The man responsible, this fellow right here, the man responsible for gun regulations of the United States of America said he is not the number one firearm expert in the room that day. Now tell me how that makes sense, folks. It makes no sense at all. So this non-expert, I will say he's a non-expert. This non-expert, Mr. Dettelbeck, introduced a final ATF rule in January which would reclassify pistols as short-barreled rifles if they have a stabilizing brace attached. This rule would also require American gun owners, many of who are veterans, to either register pistols with stabilization braces with the ATF, turn over those firearms, or face 10 years in jail. Yes, 10 years in jail. We don't give that. We don't give murders that with in the, in the justice system today, and up to a ten thousand dollar fine. It is quite evident to me and everybody that watched that hearing yesterday that this man is not a firearms expert. He does not understand our disabled veterans and other Americans rely on these braces to use their firearms. He does not understand that this is an abuse of rulemaking authority. He does not understand our constitution provides God-fearing Americans, many of us in this room, the right to bear arms. And I tell you, I'm a proud co-sponsor of this resolution today to repeal 
Mr. Dettelbeck's unconstitutional pistol brace rule. And I urge, I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank the gentleman, uh, Chair, now I recognize the gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. So here we are again this evening in the wee hours of the morning already, just four days after the deadly mass shooting at a Sweet 16 party in Alabama, which took four young lives and injured 32 more. Nine days after a young man in Louisville shot and killed five of his colleagues with an AR-15 style rifle. And of course, less than a month after a heavily armed assailant slaughtered three young children, babies, at an elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee. And I could just go on and on and on to note the more than 160 mass shootings this country has already seen this year. But I don't know if we'd even have enough time because there already have been more mass shootings in this country, in the United States of America, than there have been days in this year. Today, my colleagues on the other side have brought us here to reject an ATF rule, which would ensure that stabilizing braces, firearms attachments used to convert large format pistols, such as AR-15s and AK-47s into short barrel rifles, that that cannot be the accessory of choice for mass shooters. Shooters like the one in Dayton, Ohio, who took nine lives, like the shooter in Boulder, Colorado, that mass shooting, which took 10 lives. And as we've recently learned, like the shooter in the Nashville mass shooting who took lives of three children and three adults. It was this most recent shooting, the one at an elementary school in Nashville that was so horrific that it caused my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to postpone their originally planned markup of this very rule that we were discussing right now, a rule designed to prevent that exact scenario. But here we are today, what is it, 12.05, 12.07 in the morning, to push through this markup after yet another mass shooting. Because there will always be another mass shooting until all of us in Congress have the courage to protect our children and our families. There is never a right time. There will never be a right time to bring weapons of war and mass destruction to our streets. What we are doing at this midnight hour is not just about arguing about a piece of plastic. This is about trying to save innocent lives. And the American public is sick and tired. They're sick and tired of your thoughts and your prayers. Trust me, I'm a victim of gun violence. And when it happens to you, I pray that you might think differently. I pray you might have the courage and the com compassion and humility to think about the pain and suffering. I pray that it never happens to anyone in this room. I pray that we have the conscience to stand up and do right by America. This is not about a piece of plastic. This is about saving the lives, and this is about humanity in America. And I yield the balance of my time to my colleague from Texas. I thank the gentlelady. I'll just take a very quick moment. First of all, let me thank and give respect to all combat veterans who know how to use weapons. That is not the tradition of most of those who are using weapons in mass shootings. To my friends who suggest they get the guns in the hands of criminals. Uh, the individual in Louisville was a former employee in Nashville, former student, um, as has been heard in Buffalo, white supremacist, in El Paso, white supremacist. 
Uh, these cannot be described as criminals. They can be, be described as people who've had access to guns who should not have gotten the guns in their hands. They have committed a crime. And the other thing, criminal. let me say this bogus argument about those with disabilities and veterans, we all respect veterans, but thousands of firearms and accessories on the market are not subject to the NFA and can be used by people with disabilities. The mayor, it is important to note, if I may add this uh, into no, the record, Mr. Chairman, yep. as unanimous consent to place into the record letter from the, um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors addressed to Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Nadler regarding this legislation. They oppose it. Nullifying the federal rule un around stabilizing braces would make it easier for mass shooters to access weapons of war Not and objection. would weaken ATF's authority to enforce a law that's Not been objection. on the books for nearly 100 years. Ask unanimous consent. Without objection. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to uh, correct the record as to uh, the leading cause of death of children. That is a statistic that has been thrown around uh, rather aggressively this evening. Um, it is not true. And in fact, that is not what the CDC data shows. What people are relying upon is an inaccurate study uh, that does not relate specifically to minors, but actually included 18 and 19 year old adults. The three uh, top causes of death for children are certain conditions originating in the perinatal period, congenital malformations, deformations, and chromosomal abnormalities, and symptoms, signs, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings. That's actually the CDC data itself. If you actually look at children 12 years and younger, um, the other additional causes of death, leading causes of death are suffocation, motor vehicle accidents, and drowning, uh, all of which are more than the deaths caused by firearms. So I just want to make sure that the record is accurate uh, so that we don't uh, deal with those uh, bad statistics. Um, I also want to say that it is very clear to me that my colleagues on the other side uh, apparently believe that guns and pistol braces and other inanimate objects have the ability to stand up, walk out of the house, drive down the street, and act on their own volition. But that is not the case. Guns do not act without the person actually shooting them. And what we need to be doing is focusing on the criminals. Um, so what I would say is, uh, uh, one of my colleagues just said this uh, hearing is not about a piece of plastic. But that's exactly what it is about, because that is the issue before us this evening, and it demonstrates the problem with the FDA, or the, excuse me, the ATF regulation in the first place. The ATF has issued a regulation attempting to outlaw pistol braces. The ATF does not have the legal authority to do that. If my colleagues on the other side want to have a debate about banning guns and the Second Amendment, I suggest that we have the hearing specific to that issue, because what we're dealing with tonight is a regulation in the Congressional Review Act. So the fact that the uh, Democrats have immediately gone to gun control and banning weapons and banning uh, and attempting to take away our Second Amendment rights, I think very clearly shows uh, exactly the problem with the ATF rule and why it should be uh, uh, repealed because of the fact that the ATF does not have the legal authority to do that. It's the legislative body that has the legal authority to act. And then at that point, we also have to address the Second Amendment. But I just want to read something very quickly here that I was just looking up as I was listening to this, uh, to, to the testimony and to the statements made today. Um, this is something that was we just had a, 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 an anniversary yesterday, and I'm just going to read this very quickly um, because I think it epitomizes where the other side is coming from on this discussion. The sun never set on the British Empire. It was the largest empire in world history. Out of nearly 200 countries in the world, only 22 were never controlled, invaded, or attacked by Britain. In April of 1775, the British Royal Military Governor of Massachusetts General Thomas Gage sent 800 British Army regulars under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith on a preemptive raid to seize guns from American patriots at Lexington and Concord. George Mason of Virginia stated, to disarm the people is the best and most effectual way to enslave them. 
That is why we have the Second Amendment. It protects our ability to keep and bear arms. The ATF does not have the legal authority to adopt the rule that they have. To the extent that there is to be any discussion about the banning of guns, it should be taking place in the legislative body with the understanding and the analysis of the Second Amendment that is appropriate. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Gen Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. That was good. The lady yields back. The gentleman is recognized for unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent that the article from the Kaiser Family Foundation entitled Firearms Are the Leading Cause of Death for Children in the United States be included in the record. Objection. And the second article um, from NPR in uh, April 22nd, 2022, Firearms Overtook Auto Accidents as the Leading Cause of Death in Children be made a part of the record. Uh, without objection, uh, uh, so ordered. The gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Goose, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chairman. Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think it'd be helpful to provide some context and, and perhaps help clear the record a bit because I've heard differing arguments from my colleagues on the other side, some of which are grossly inconsistent. So, you know, my, my friend, Mr. Massey, makes the argument, which I actually think comports with the language of the final rule, that this final rule requires registration. But then I hear my colleague from Wyoming declare that it outlaws these devices. Clearly, that's inconsistent. And, you know, I, again, I think Mr. Massey is actually accurate, correct on that front. And I think that it's important for us to have an intellectually honest debate. By that same token, uh, Mr. my friend Mr. Issa, who's not here uh, earlier, but referenced the Obama administration. I believe a number of my colleagues have done so with respect to the the genesis of this rulemaking, no one has referenced the fact that this rulemaking began at least in part during the Trump administration. And so let me just take you down a trip on memory lane. In March of 2020, during the Trump administration, a manufacturer submitted a firearm equipped with brace model SBA3 to the ATF for classification. ATF determined that it was subject to the NFA as a short-barreled rifle because, quote, all of the objective design features are consistent with weapons designed to be fired from the shoulder. That's evidenced by the many videos that my colleague, Representative Cicilline from Rhode Island, showed, and, and that it defies uh, any of the arguments that were made on the other side of the aisle with respect to the, um, the design of the weapon on that front. ATF examined a firearm with a different model brace and reached the opposite conclusion. By late 2020, still during the Trump administration, ATF concluded that there was a need to provide clarity to the firearms industry and the American people on how ATF evaluates firearms equipped with stabilizing braces and that manufacturers, some manufacturers were adding to the confusion by falsely labeling braces as quote, ATF compliant when ATF had not evaluated them. ATF determined that for these reasons and due to the extensive use of these firearms to create short barreled rifles without following NFA requirements, it was necessary to issue public guidance. This is important. On December 18th, 2020, this is during the Trump administration, not the Biden administration, ATF published a notice in the Federal Register entitled Objective Factors for Classifying Weapons with Stabilizing Braces. That guidance included factors similar to those that are in the final rule at issue in this markup. As you all know, I know many of you signed on to the letter a few days later, on December 22nd, 90 House Republicans sent a letter to the ATF imploring the ATF to essentially rescind that guidance. And the ATF then ultimately complied. And on December 30th, ATF withdrew the public guidance. Three months later, a murderer in Boulder, Colorado, used a Ruger AR-556 pistol equipped with an SB Tactical SBA-3 stabilizing brace to kill 10 people, 10 of my constituents. I represent Boulder. I think many of you know that. One of those constituents was a police officer who bravely lost his life, made the ultimate sacrifice. I'm disappointed by the majority's decision to pursue this resolution. I don't get it. And for those who are watching, it, what, it's 12, 15 a.m. in Washington, D.C. I think the American people can get a very clear picture of the priorities of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, many of whom I consider to be friends. We could be taking up bills to 
address inflation. We could be taking bills to build safer communities. One of my colleagues talked about the steps to harden schools to provide security assistance to places of public accommodation. That's something I support. I've introduced a bill for two years in a row now. I've been able to get a single Republican to co-sponsor. But instead, we're here debating a measure to undermine federal law enforcement's efforts when it sought to crack down on those who were using stabilizing braces as short-barreled rifles to evade the NFA. That's it. I would hope that the majority would reconsider their priorities moving forward. Let's work together to find some solutions to these consequential challenges. But this isn't it. That I can assure you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. It's been a long night, and I'm going to try to be pretty quick here because I don't think we're going to convince them, and I don't think they're going to convince us. But there's a few things I want to say. So much of this really is political. I guess folks don't want to admit it, but I mean, you had control. You had the pre and you've heard this before. You had the executive branch. You had the House. You had the Senate. And now it all gets blamed on us. You could have made change then. You had the majority in every single House, but it didn't, ha it didn't happen. And it's always a political answer. You know why? Because it sounds so good. Let's take guns away from legal gun owners that 99.9% .9 don't do anything wrong ever, but that will fix the problem. It won't fix the problem. So we'll make this brace illegal. Now, are you going to tell me because we make this brace illegal that criminals and those with mental health problems are going to, you know, decide, gee, I can't use the brace anymore, so I'm just going to stop. They're breaking the law. They're murderers or they have serious mental health issues. They're not going to change because you change a law. They are already used to breaking the law, and the people will still do it, will continue to do it. We do need to do things that was mentioned here a couple of times, like making our schools safer. And I'd love people to join me on my bill, my safe schools bill, which would make sure that people just couldn't walk straight into a school, that before they walked in, they had to be buzzed in not once, but twice, and that you had a safety officer there and the safety officer could make sure that things were safe in the inside. And I guarantee you that crime would go down in schools, that mass murders would go down in schools. And in New York City, some folks, I guess, made fun of the victims, and even tonight you did. Well, you know, the interesting thing about those victims, one was got the living daylights beaten out of them, and the other two, it was victims of night, of knives. So, you know, we, I guess, could take knives away, but, you know, we're always going to bl blame guns because guns are scary. People talk about guns. They don't even understand what really is an assault weapon. What's an automatic? What's a semi-automatic? Most of the people making the rules, most of the people will be doing order. the legislation don't even understand what they're doing legislation about. Well, I shoot at the range. I shoot at the range once to twice a week. I'm a gun owner. I believe in the Second Amendment. And those that say that older people, disabled people, and veterans aren't there using those devices aren't sh telling the truth. I don't know how else to say it. It's not accurate. Because if you go there, you'll see them. You know, individuals who have enjoyed this for years, they're older, their hands are shaky, people that have neurologic problems, people that ever have other health issues, and, and, and the older veterans. Maybe if we had better prosecutors that didn't keep having a revolving door and turn bad people out, and areas where we keep making the rules tighter and harder for guns, Chicago, New York, California, the crimes are going up and the shootings are going up because we're letting bad people out of jail. But that doesn't matter, I guess. The truth is those folks that commit those kind of aggressive crimes, those criminals should stay in jail for a good long time, maybe forever. 
And finally, like I said, I'd welcome anybody to join my Safe School Act if they really believe that they want to make a difference, because that will make a difference. Mr. Hunt was so right. His speech was so good. He was on the money. Here's a somebody who's a veteran. Here's somebody who was in the military. Here's somebody who's in war. Here's somebody who understands guns, like the people at the range where I shoot. And they wouldn't even understand what half of you were talking about because it doesn't work. So make them illegal. Make these braces illegal. And let's see, because you're going to promise people it's going to make things better, how much better it gets. And you know Andrew, the, will you yield for one, just one clarification? No, i got to finish this. Oh, and and you know what else it doesn't show? It doesn't show that the statistics show, look them up, when they were illegal, in New Jersey, in certain areas, it was no better crime-wise. It didn't make a difference. A bad person or a person with severe mental health problems are still going to commit crimes. And there's much better ways to go about that. We need more mental health work being done in our country. And I don't know who asked me, but I will yield. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentleman yields back. Appreciate the gentleman. The gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, it is 12.25 a.m. in the United States Congress, and if anyone wants to know what is the priority of their member of Congress, well, on the other side of the aisle for the Republican Party, at this early hour, it's to better arm the killers of our children. That's the priority. It's not, as Mr. Nagu said, to fight inflation. It's not to bring down the cost of health care. It's not to give women their own right to carry a baby. It's to make sure that every criminal in America has better access to a right to carry a device, as Mr. Nagus laid out, can kill innocent souls in our community. It's, it's midnight in Washington, a book also written by a colleague of mine just to the right, but it's been night in Washington and my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle are fighting to arm the killers. A lot of talk today about veterans and that's great. I think we, we all wanna do what we can to honor veterans. I thought it was interesting that 12 hours ago when Mr. Massey offered an amendment in an immigration bill to help veterans with the E-Verify system, almost everyone on his side voted against it. So. Uh, it, it's clear where you draw the line when you want to help veterans. No one wanted to help the veterans when it came to immigration, but when it comes to uh, this legislation, that's your fig leaf as, as far as why you're in favor of it. But I really want to address Mr. Van Drew because he used the word ban about 10 times and the word illegal about five times. And there's nothing in this regulation that would ban a stabilizer. It's not a ban on a stabilizer. It's the crazy idea that it should be registered. It's not a ban at all. No one's talking about a ban. In fact, I think almost everyone on this side thinks that you should be able to take your kids hunting, go to the range and shoot for sport, and have a shotgun to protect yourself in your home for self-defense. That's what most of us believe. And so the registration requirement is not only within the mainstream of America, most research shows it's within the mainstream of gun owning Republicans. So it's not a ban and we're, we're gonna fight back and debunk all of the disinformation that you can continue to throw out. So when you drag us all over the country for your field hearings, and you want to go to New York to talk about crime, we're going to tell you, Mr. Chairman, the crime rate in Mansfield, Ohio, also known as Danger City, comparative to Manhattan, doesn't fare so well. So we're going to continue to call it out. When you were dragging the committee to New York, there was a homicide in your hometown that the police were still trying to solve, used and committed with the firearm. So we're going to continue to call out the disinformation. This is not a ban. This is a registration requirement. No one here is talking about bans. And with that, I'll yield my remaining time to my colleague from Rhode Island. No, I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. I, I, I think it's important to note that the figure that has been used was uh, 
40 million, 10 million. And, and I think Mr. Schiff made it very clear when this device was first developed, it was to assist people who had disabilities. But as we saw from the video, it's now being marketed to turn this into a short barrel rifle. Uh, and all we're saying is if it is going to be that kind of a dangerous firearm, it's been regulated for a very long time and it re requires registration, plain and simple. And I think, you know, Mr. Swalwell is right. It's 1230 in the morning. And the only action that this Republican majority has taken in response to an epidemic of gun violence in this country is to attack a rule of the ATF that will help make these weapons less lethal and require a registration of a brace. That's the sum total of your response to the carnage of gun violence in this country. You have the majority. We'll stay here till four in the morning if you're serious about reducing gun violence. But instead, it was an argument made last time this hearing came up that we should abolish the ATF. I guess we should be grateful you stepped that back and you're just trying to abolish some of the good rules that they've promulgated that are gonna make us safer. Thank the gentleman for yielding, I yield back. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is late here, and uh, you know, Mr. Swalwell has been gone most of the day, but I just want to note real quickly that um, he just accused Republicans of, quote, wanting to arm killers. You know, and I just want to say, when you say outrageous things like that, you obviously diminish your own arguments and your own credibility. I, I represent Louisiana. Uh, we're nicknamed the sportsman's paradise. I mean, in, in, in Louisiana, we, we revere our Second Amendment rights. We, we hunt with our children. We teach them responsible gun safety and ownership. We, we're serious about preserving our fundamental freedoms and, and the great traditions of this country. And when you try to diminish people who stand for that, it undermines your, your own argument. Look, I'm telling you what my constituents in Louisiana see. When they, when they think of the ATF, many people, when they see the ATF, they see that it's one of the alphabet agencies in Washington that was designed to serve the people and is being used against them. You have their authority um, that's being abused here. You have, as was pointed out earlier uh, by Mr. Nails, you have the director of the ATF in front of Congress under oath who can't even describe his own job. He can't even adequately define the very uh, firearms that he's supposed to be regulating. And it undermines the people's faith in our institutions and, and, and in this agency that's just run amok. I wanna yield my time to Mr. Massey because he has a lot to add to this. Yeah, I think, I think Mr. Johnson, uh, depending on the state that you live in, and your response to this ATF rule, it either uh, will ban, register, or destroy stabilizing braces for pistols that resemble collapsible stocks. Do you know, and I think everybody on the other side of the aisle is about to get really surprised at what I'm about to say. Do you know what this doesn't ban, register, or destroy? Collapsible stocks. It only banned, registers, or destroys stabilizing braces for pistols that resemble collapsible stocks. There are even more collapsible stocks than there are stabilizing braces. Now, why doesn't this rule ban, destroy, or otherwise register collapsible stocks? Because they can't do it. There's no construction, even in their tortured legal logic that they've, that they've made to ban stable ban register or destroy stabilizing braces that resemble collapsible stocks they are not able to ban collapsible stocks i've got these things laying around at home it's a piece of plastic there's honestly really no reason to regulate this piece of plastic you could recreate it recreate one easily uh, so what are you going to do everything that the democrats don't like is a loophole I've tried to figure out what their definition of a loophole is. Everything they don't like is a loophole. So then I'm afraid they're going to be back and say there's the collapsible stock loophole. We, you know, through regulation, not through lawmaking, but through regulatory uh, fiat, we were, you know, somebody was able, some unelected bureaucrat was able to ban, register, or destroy something that resembled a collapsible stock, but they were not able to ban a collapsible stock. So you're not making anything less lethal. Now, those collapsible stocks, if you're a law-abiding citizen, have to be used on a rifle, okay? What's the difference between a rifle, an AR-15 rifle, and an AR-15 pistol? 
Does anybody on the other side of the aisle know? I'll wait. They don't even know what a collapsible well, stock well, is. Well, let me, I mean, because I think it's important. I'm always torn on whether I should help them understand what they're trying to ban. The difference between an AR-15 pistol or an AR-15 rifle. No takers. No takers. It's about six or eight inches in length. A barrel on a rifle has to be 16 inches, and a pistol is anything less than that that doesn't have something designed or intended to be fired from the shoulder. So uh, you're not getting rid of these things. What you're doing, you know, there's a saying, if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. That's supposed to be a prediction, but I think the Biden administration used that as an instruction. And they said, well, let's, we can create a bunch of outlaws by banning a piece of plastic. And that's what they've done, and that's what's going to happen on June 1st. Millions, millions of felons who don't realize they're felons. And these are serious felonies. This is not a civil infraction. Are, are going to be created. And just, um, well, if I have more time later, I'll get to the, the fact or the non-fact that Mr. Cicilline pointed out, the Kaiser Foundation, and I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. I think the chairman, I think my friend from Kentucky associate myself with his remarks. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go with all of this. I mean, look, I think the truth is, I think the Supreme Court or the courts before it gets to the Supreme Court will kill this. Um, and I think they'll be right to do so. Um, I think this is an extreme overreach by the executive branch in total violation of the Constitution, the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and it should alarm all of us, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, and regardless of what you want to achieve. I want to see a wall get built along the southern border. I supported President Trump doing so, supported President Trump using emergency authority to do it, but was happy to introduce legislation to limit that authority, to limit executive power. We should all want to do that. But instead, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are completely ignoring this blatant abuse by the administrative bureaucrats in the executive branch because they like the outcome. But we should all be troubled by it. And we shouldn't just defer to the courts to defend our constitutional rights and separation of powers. We have an obligation to do it. So with all due respect to my colleagues complaining about being here at 1240 in the morning, not doing anything important, I think what we're doing here is of the utmost importance and not because of the inherent substance of the question, but because we have an obligation to defend the constitutional separation of powers. And we are doing that here rather than punting to the courts. It is critically important that we do this. There are a bunch of different things that could go through. But the one thing that's clear here is my colleagues here, this is not about wanting to just get rid of this piece of plastic or have registration. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to ban these weapons. We know this, they've said so repeatedly. Probably most of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle here, I don't know, certainly the president, certainly most, they want to ban them, they want to get rid of them. They'd like to get rid of many more weapons, semi-automatic pistols, otherwise. Almost all of which are in commonplace use. And I could focus on all of that, but we don't have enough time. I think the most important thing to focus on right now is not the guns, but it's, but, but it's what's happening. Why is this happening? What is happening to our young men? that they will walk into a school and do this? What are we, what, what kind of a society are we operating in? And if you, if you look at the data right now in terms of what's happening, in a period uh, just, just right before COVID, data had 81,000 emergency department visits by young people as young as five coded for suicidal ideation. Quarter of those turned into hospital stays. Suicide rates skyrocketed during COVID. Suicidal thoughts skyrocketed during COVID. The fact is the people who are perpetrating these things, you know, young, male, angry, notably disturbed, 
refusal to attend school, anger toward girls and women, antisocial, no sense to belong to family, to school, to a community, and threats online. You go down the whole list of what's going on. We are a unchurched, detached, immoral society that is focusing too damn much on social media and what you can get on all of these devices. If we don't address that, none of this matters. We are leaving a generation of Americans completely removed from what it actually takes to engage in society and function. We are killing our children. We are killing them every second we allow them to sit on these devices all day, stewing on 24-hour news cycles of the most negative influence you can possibly have on a regular basis. I had an event that I was at with my son Easter weekend where devices were not allowed. We spent all day with a whole lot of people that we didn't know and talked to them from other states, other walks of life. And it was wonderful. And if we don't address this, and if we don't address our families, and if we don't address our societal problem and the lack of families and the lack of fathers and the lack of community, we are going to lose it if we haven't already lost it. Problem isn't the guns. The problem isn't the, it's the fact that we're letting our society rot, a cultural rot. That is our calling as leaders of this society. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a familiar pattern. After every criminal atrocity, the, the Democrats call for a new round of gun control laws. And now we have more than 50 years of experience with those gun control laws. You'd think if they actually worked, things would be getting better and not worse. Uh, we found these laws are very effective at disarming law-abiding citizens. We've also found they're extremely ineffective at disarming criminals and terrorists and madmen. We know how to reduce gun violence, prosecute gun criminals, send violent criminals to, to jail until they're old and gray, execute the murderers, harden our schools, and find the dangerously mentally ill so that we can treat them. Stop letting terrorists into our country across our southern borders. Yet these are the time-proven measures the Democrats refuse to restore or even to consider. Woke Democratic district attorneys often refuse to prosecute gun criminals or they quickly drop gun charges to reduce their sentences. The Democrats have all but abolished the death penalty. They've released dangerous criminals from our prisons, released dangerous illegal aliens into our communities. They've flooded our streets with the dangerously mentally ill. They've turned a blind eye as terrorists come across the border that they've left wide open. And then they wonder why we're plagued with violent criminals. I am as sick of these crimes as the Democrats say they are. So here's a modest suggestion. Let's get the criminals and madmen off the streets, fire the woke district attorneys and prosecute violent criminals to the maximum extent of the law. And if that's not enough, then strengthen those laws. And while we're at it, let us also reclaim the constitutional guardrails that reserve to the elected representatives mm -hmm. of the people the sole prerogative to make these laws. The Democrats love to talk about threats to democracy. Well, one of the most fundamental threats to democracy is removing the power to legislate from democratically elected representatives of the people who are accountable to our democracy and giving it instead to unelected bureaucrats we're immune and often contemptuous of that democracy. That's what this measure does, is to restore those guardrails. And uh, with that, if Mr. Massey has anything to add, yes, I'll yield to him. Absolutely. Uh, just to reiterate the point that Ms. Hagerman from Wyoming made, this the data that the gentleman submitted for the record is flawed. Uh, they exclude children under the ages of one, and they include adults aged 18 and 19. Specifically, the Kaiser study that Mr. Cicilline submitted for the record has this flaw. And when you quit excluding children under the age of one, and when you quit including 
ages 18 and 19. By the way, those are mostly gang deaths uh, involved in gang violence. Uh, it's simply not true that it's the leading cause of death for children. By, well, would the by anybody's for a question? definition of children. Yes, sir. I'll yield. Does, does that mean that between the ages of 2 and 19, gun violence is the leading cause of death under your statistics? Uh, the Kaiser study says that, yes. And uh, You're okay with that? No, no death is good. No, it doesn't because you're not between 2 and 18, 2 to 9, or 1 to 19. But reclaiming Mr. <laughs> Clintock's time, let me be clear about what this, what, what's happened, because I don't want, I don't want you all to walk away thinking this will save lives. I really don't. This is an aesthetic, ergonomic, cosmetic accessory to a firearm. It doesn't change the muzzle velocity. It does, in spite of Mr. Cicilline's claims in a, in a prior hearing, it doesn't change the rate of fire. It doesn't change the capacity of the weapon. You could say, the, the one thing you could say is it improves the concealability by eight inches, but in most of these shootings, that I, all of the shootings that I've seen on camera, the person is not concealing anything. They are coming in guns blazing, concealability. They are living in a fantasy a lot of times fueled by prescription drugs that have separated them from reality. If there needs to be any kind of data that we need in front of this committee, any kind of report or any kind of registry, it should be, we should have access to know which prescription drugs these killers were on at the time they committed the crime. And that should be collected by FDA. They're supposed to say that these are safe and effective and report the side effects. And if we could do one thing at this level, that would be it. And I yield back to the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, unanimous consent request. I'm going to try one more time. I'd ask unanimous consent to put into record a politifact from the Austin American statement, are firearms the leading cause of death of children? Yes, into the record. So I, objection. I have gentleman, asked unanimous consent request. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. To submit for the record an article uh, from two and a half weeks ago in Snopes of all places, which fact checks Mr. Cicilline's information and shows that Ms. Hagelman is correct, not Mr. Cicilline. Fact checking the fact checkers. All right, but without, without objection, uh, so ordered the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I can't believe that we've, we're finding comfort in the fact that the leading cause of death is, you know, for two and 19 is guns, but not under one. That's, that's supposed to be okay. Look, Mr. Roy, Mr. Massey, I, I have tremendous respect for both of you. I appreciate what, you, what you've said tonight, Mr. Roy in particular. Uh, your comments about uh, the struggles of young men, I think, is, is right on the money. Uh, but where we part company is the concept of, you know, guns don't kill people and sort of marginalizing the impact that guns have. Uh, I became a prosecutor in 1990. I believe you were a prosecutor at one point, too. I was here in Washington, D.C. It was the height of the crack wars. And the big change that happened between when I was a young man and what, what started happening in the 1990s was when a fist fight turned into a gunfight. That was the big change. And adding more powerful weapons, and you might recall that the, the nine millimeters came in, the cops got scared, they had to move up from revolvers, so then they got more powerful weapons. We had this escalation of guns on the street just in that cycle with the police and, and the drug dealers. Going along at the same time as that, we had the growth of guns. You know, we didn't have 400 million guns in America 30 years ago. A big part of the problem right now is they're everywhere and they're easily accessible. We can talk about mental health and trying to track down men, you know, who are or have caused crimes and we should lock them up forever. The problem is we've got first time offenders that, do, that are doing the mass killings. You know, so, so if we leave all these guns easily accessible, like they are right now, um, we're gonna continue to have these like mass shootings every day. And, and so, look, I, I, I don't disagree, I, I, don't, I, I don't wanna say that your views on these things are, are somehow dishonest or anything like that. I, I'm not attributing bad motives to your views. What I am asking though, is that from our perspective, certainly, you know, maybe yours too, 
we've got to figure out something to stop these mass killings. I mean, it, it, it is just appalling now that you, the Alabama mass killing. I mean, somebody was talking about the mass shooting. I, I thought they were still talking about Nashville because they're coming so fast, it's hard to even keep track of. We've got to, we've got to like come to grips with the fact that that is not acceptable. We've got to figure something out. So when I look to you all, and you guys are pushing back at us, and that's fine, but when I look to you all, you're in the majority now. I wasn't here last year. And the only gun legislation we get through the Judiciary Committee is this one, and which we all know will do nothing either way to address mass gun violence. It, it just won't. And so, you know, is there anything you guys would accept? I mean, more background checks, banning ghost guns? Is, is there anything that you would put on the table? I mean, anything that might start to address the problem. Because right now, we're in a holding pattern. I think it was uh, one of your colleagues over there that said, hey, you know, it's late at night. I'm not going to convince you. You're not going to convince me. Okay, fine. But there's got to be some kind of common ground. I can't believe that you all are are comfortable with the status quo. And I, 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 I get your point about, you know, um, having more guns on the street or, you know, more people having guns. I don't think that's the solution. I, we had a conversation earlier. One of you was testifying about being in places where a lot of people have guns so you feel safer. But I was here when a guy walked into MPD, that's the police department here in Washington, D.C., and lit up the place. He killed police off. Everybody's armed. He shoots it up. I remember the Fort Hood shooting in 2009. 13 people were killed. Everybody's armed and actually trained how to use them, uh, their weapons to defend themselves. We had a shooting here in the Capitol uh, as well. Somebody walked in and started shooting at people. It happens everywhere. Everybody having guns doesn't fix the problem. We've got to find a better way to go at it. And by the way, I, my, I've got five sons. One of them was a school teacher. And you know when you decided to go? When they started saying, like, well, you guys are going to have to get guns. Maybe that's the way to go. You know, fire drills to go into active shooter drills. Mr. Roy, you want to talk about impact on our children that's negative and causing these kind of problems? That's got to be one of them. I see I've run out of my time. But let's find a way. You guys are going to win this vote today, obviously. But is, can we do something? as we move forward to start trying to address these problems in a bipartisan way and, and do something to slow this down? I mean, anything. Mr. I yield gentlemen, back. Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman, gentlemen's time, have a unanimous consent request. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman's recognized for unanimous consent. I'd like to submit for the record, uh, Pew Research data uh, d dated February 3rd, 2022, which shows, and I think this gets to Mr. Ivey's point, which I respect greatly, it shows that the majority of these firearm deaths that we're quoting in these adolescent years are suicides. That's the majority of them. Without, without, and, that, without, and that is something that we need to focus without on. Objection, I, without, without objection, the, uh, uh, we'll be uh, entered in the record. A reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorably reporting. Oh, I was told that was our last. I apologize. Ms. Jai Paul is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm going to yield my time to Ms. Jackson Lee, but I just okay. wanted to say for anybody who does want to focus on suicides, I do have a bill that is a, a voluntary waiver bill for guns for people to be, and I, and I brought it in the last session, and unfortunately, um, you all didn't want to vote for it, but it, it is a program that's working in Washington State and in Utah where people who are experiencing suicidal thoughts can voluntarily turn their gun in. They can get it back whenever they want. Um, but I, I guess I just want to say, you know, it's been a long night, but I want to say that I was moved by your words, Mr. Ivey, and um, I think it's exhausting. It's really exhausting to constantly feel like there is literally nothing that... Um, we can bring to the floor and that we just have these moments of silence and then we go back to our districts and people say well what are you guys doing about about these mass shootings why is it that the united states is the only country in the world that goes through this why can't we stop these mass shootings and 
more guns is not the answer, nor is constantly saying that the only way we're going to deal with this is to, is to arm ourselves. That, that cannot be the answer. And we can talk about mental health and we can talk about all those other things. By the way, those things take money and funding. And so hopefully y'all are going to contribute to that funding when, when the appropriations budget comes and we're not going to see cuts to Medicaid and to mental health and to, and, and to public schools for that matter. But I guess I just want to say that even when I brought my gun waiver bill last session, and we passed it out of committee because we were in the majority, I had, I had two Republican co-sponsors on that, by the way. And um, the NRA had told one of them, my lead sponsor, John Curtis from Utah, because it's working in Utah, that they weren't going to oppose the bill. And at the last minute, they decided they had to oppose the bill because everything is a slippery slope. So I hope that, I, I assume that when you go back to your districts, people ask you about this too. I'm not sure what you say to them. I'm not sure how you respond to the fact that we are legislators in Congress who are not powerless. We actually do have power to enact laws that can keep our kids from being shot. I have kids every day that come up to me, parents that come up to me and tell me that their kids had to go through these active shooter drills. You're talking about that? And the trauma, I've had psychologists testify to me, come into my office and tell me about the trauma that it causes to their kids to go through these active shooter drills, that some of them have bad dreams over and over and over again because they actually feel like this is happening to them. That is what these active shooter drills are. They try to train you to deal with what's happening by putting you through something where you don't know that it's a drill. It's not like they say, okay, the fire drill is going to go, you know, the fire alarm is going to go off and we're going to do a fire drill. There's an actual active shooter drill where it's a surprise. And then kids have to practice this. How is that? How is that something that any of us want for, for our kids? So I just, I guess I'm, I'm, I, was, I was moved by Mr. Roy as well and the passion in your voice, uh, but I, I just hope that we can think about our role here in Congress and not say that we're powerless and it's just about the bad guys who have the guns. That's ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. I mean, we legislated seat belts because we knew that that would stop people from being killed when they're in a car accident. And this isn't banning anything, by the way, as has been said over and over again. It's just asking people to register. I'm sorry, I got carried away and I was gonna yield my time to you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Did you want that? 21 seconds, can you just yield a minute to me? Okay, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for unanimous consent. I have a unanimous consent request to submit for the record a paper by Crime Prevention Research Center comparing the global rate of mass public shootings, the U.S. rates, and comparing their changes over time. The U.S. is well below the world average in terms of number of mass public shootings per capita. And not as a consolation, but just as a rebuttal to what's been said here tonight, which was not true. Without objection, gentleman from Texas recognized for unanimous consent. Put your mic on. Without objection. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Escobar. I yield Recognize. to um, my colleague from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, let me, um, I thank the gentlelady very much. Uh, let me echo uh, the plea that Congressman Ivey made um, in this late hour, uh, we're not going to end this discussion tonight. We'll have a vote tonight. But it pains me to think that we cannot find common ground. We've mentioned a lot of bills. Excuse my voice. There's a storage bill, Kimberly Vaughn storage bill. I can't imagine why we would not want to ensure that people store their guns in Texas. 
one of the largest accesses to guns by criminals are guns unstored in homes and cars because we are a gun state and we lose a lot of lives. So my plea is the same as the congressman, a former federal prosecutor, that we can find some common ground. The second thing is I want to commend the ATF because they are the organization that has stood in the gap in gun trafficking to stop these guns that are coming. Mexico pleads with us to stop the gun trafficking that arms the cartels. But the APF, ATS has had the fortitude to press forward in the face of unfair attacks and bullying by the House Republicans. And the director of the ATF, we visited in my home district and went to the ATF facility. And they do magnificent work with high technology. As I mentioned, all of us don't have the privilege of having combat veterans protect us. And the children that have died and the victims that have died specifically by stabilizing braces being used to steady the gun. And let's put on the table the fact that you can hide your guns with braces, as Mr. Johnson from Georgia had said. So I just want to leave this statistic for people who seem not to be affected or impacted by Congressman McBath, who has over and over spoken of her pain that she still speaks of, and others who are in their homes tonight suffering the loss of their children, their loved one, and those recent killings. In 2022, there were 20,118 firearm deaths, excluding suicides. That's people. And this is CNN, November 23rd, 2022. That's 10 times the number killed on 9-11. This happens year after year after year. I just don't know why the pleas that we've made on this side, each and every member, cannot be answered. It is not being answered tonight, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, a reporting quorum being present. The question is on favorability reporting the resolution. All those in favor say uh, aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the resolution Roll is ordered call. to be reported in favor to the House. Members will have two-day submit views. Roll call. roll call being requested will go to a roll call. The clerk will call that roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Issa. Mr. Issa votes yes. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey. Hang on. Committee will be in order. We got to finish the roll call. Mr. Massey. Thomas. Thomas. Mr. Massey votes yes. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes yes. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes yes. Ms. Sparts. Ms. Sparts votes yes. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Klein. Mr. Klein votes aye. Mr. Gooden. Mr. Van Drew. Mr. Van Drew votes yes. Mr. Nels. Mr. Nels votes yes. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore votes yes. Mr. Kiley. Mr. Kiley votes yes. Ms. Hageman. Ms. Hageman votes yes. Mr. Moran. Mr. Moran votes yes. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes yes. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt votes yes. It'll Mr. Be in Fry. Order. Mr. Fry votes aye. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Ms. Jackson Lee. No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff votes no. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell. Nope. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu votes no. Ms. Jayapal. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Mr. Nagus. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath. Ms. McBath votes no. Ms. Dean. 
Ms. Escobar. Ms. Escobar votes no. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Mr. Ivy. Mr. Ivy votes no. Gentleman from Florida. Mr. Gates, you're not recorded. Mr. Gates votes aye. Of all members voted. 2315. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 15 noes. The ayes have it and the resolution is ordered to be reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. This concludes the committee's business for the day. The meeting is adjourned. Awesome. All right, y'all. Um, what a day. 15 hours and 20 minutes later. We now know that this has been voted through and will go to the House where they'll have a full floor vote. Um, that is the next step. I want to thank several people for making the day possible. GOA, uh, we raised a ton of money for them. Got a ton of new members. Uh, Eric Pratt, uh, Stephen Stambulia, uh, Iraq veteran 8888 was here. Uh, VSO Curtis, some of my friends, uh, the members of Timcast, uh, and, uh, thanks for stopping by. And most importantly, you, the viewer who makes this possible. I don't do this. 15 hours without you. You are the reason I do it. Um, I want to thank uh, Aiden Johnson also from GOA. He's the one lobbying hard. Who uh, I'm, I'm having a good feeling that he got a lot of that information to a lot of those people uh, kicking ass out there. So thank you all. I will see you tomorrow. Probably. Maybe. I'm beat. Uh, but until we see each other again, be safe, stay vigilant, carry a gun to keep you, your friends, your family, your community safe. I'll see you in the next one, y'all. Take care and have a phenomenal night, whatever's left of it. Take care.